Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Mad Bomber. This is a photo that was taken of someone known as the Mad Bomber. His real name is George Metzky, and he was the man who terrorized New York City for 16 years while he planted explosives in public places like an absolute psychopath. I guess he was apparently angry about a workplace injury he had suffered in the years prior to his terrible crimes, and so of course the normal reasonable jump to make would be um, not that at all. While no one should have ever had to suffer because of these crimes, the good news is that while he planted 33 bombs and set off 22 of them, miraculously only 15 people ended up injured in the end. This photo of him behind bars is extremely eerie thanks to his creepy smile and haunting eyes. I might be the only one who feels it, but it just seems like something's off. You know? In our number nine spot today, we have the figures of the fire. This photo is both extremely unsettling and super captivating as it shows a scene after the great fire at Madame Tussauds in 1925. Of course, this wax museum is famous for the extremely lifelike wax figures that are created and find their home there. So you can only imagine the aftermath of the fire. These lifelike figures with missing heads and appendages, burnt skin and hair, and just clothing in disarray. Seeing this photo for the first time without knowing the story behind it was definitely a bit of a confusing and terrifying experience. The heads on the ground really freaked me out for a full five seconds. As scary as it is, I'm glad to hear it's not real and just some creative casualties rather than what this photo appears to be at first. In our number eight spot today, we have the Spectre. This is a photo that was taken in England in 1963, and it became known as the Spectre of the Newbie Church. That is, of course, because of the ghostly figure that can be seen in the photo. I personally am always a little suspicious of ghost photos. Some are certainly more convincing than others, but Photoshop in 1963 wasn't exactly as accessible and easy as it is now. This photo is said to have been taken by Reverend K.F. Lord inside of the Newbie Church, which is located in North Yorkshire, England. Of course, I mean, like many of us are going to do, people were really skeptical of this apparition and just believed it was a well done case of double exposure, which to be fair, is entirely possible. The reverend continued to swear up and down however that the photo was not doctored, so at this point there's no proof to prove either side and it's just a game of he said she said. So what do you guys think? Apparition caught slipping or is the reverend just making it up? In our number 7 spot today we have the Tsar Bomba. This is a photo that was taken on October 30th, 1961, it was quite the Halloween spooky fright that year as this is said to be the largest and most powerful nuclear weapon ever created and tested. The hydrogen aerial bomb was developed in the Soviet Union by a group of nuclear physicists that were under the leadership of Igor Kurchatov. The bomb was dropped by parachute and was detonated autonomously. While this test was meant to be a secret, turned out to be less than well kept as it was obviously a huge explosion that was detected by United States intelligence agencies. A secret US recon aircraft called Speed Light Alpha was there monitoring the explosion and it got so close that it had its anti-radiation paint absolutely scorched off. The photo clearly shows the bomb as it exploded and it is said that this bomb was 5,000 times stronger than the ones that were dropped on Japan during World War II. That's not to say that those ones weren't strong because they were absolutely devastating, it's just an example to show how large this one really was. In our number 6 spot today we have the Three Jacksons. On August 21st, 19 1934, three fearless acrobats known as the Three Jacksons, Charlie Smith, Jewel Waddick, and Jimmy Kerrigan, all performed a routine on the edge of the Empire State Building, which is when this photo was captured. It is said that these three toured as an acrobatic trio, and this stunt the photo captured was done at 1,245 feet. According to officials from the Empire State Building, it is said that this was the first time the stunt was attempted, and to this day, it has never been done again, which makes a lot of sense. While this photo is absolutely incredible and is such a testament not only to the trust that they shared but also their abilities as acrobats, I don't know who in their right mind would try to recreate this. We already have one, I think we can just all be happy with that. In our number 5 spot today we have the Gentleman of Rehi. This photo shows the Gentleman of Rehi and that is not a gentleman and instead is the world's oldest surviving diving suit. It is an absolutely terrifying sight but also an important pillar that allowed for this kind of technology to 
developed to what it is today. The suit date backs to the early 18th century, but it came to find its home at the Rehi Museum during the 1860s after it was donated. The suit was initially designed to allow people the ability to check the hull of ships without having to bring them into dry dock. The old gentleman is made mostly of leather with pitch thread used to stitch the seams. From here, the suit is sealed with more pitch, and then to create the waterproof coat, it is covered in a mixture of mutton tallow, tar, and pitch. Of course, underwater pressure increases dramatically, and this is why there's also wooden framework in the hood in order to keep it from collapsing under the pressure. At the top of the hood, there is an opening for a wooden air pipe. The air will be pumped to the diver, then it can be released from the suit through a pipe on the back side. Of course, this means that the suit wasn't completely watertight, so divers could only go under for a short period and couldn't dive very deep because there was only so much pressure the suit could take, but still, the suit was far better than having no suit at all. In our number 4 spot today, we have ectoplasm. This photo is said to have been taken in 1910, and it shows a medium in the middle of a spiritual seance. I don't know about you, but a 1910 seance sounds like an absolutely terrifying time. This photo is said to be catching the moment that ectoplasm appears out of the mouth of the medium. When we're talking about the occult and the paranormal, ectoplasm is a viscous substance that exudes from a spiritual entity, or sometimes the earthbound medium who is connected to or communicating with the spirit. It is said that this substance can take the shape of a face, or a hand, or a complete body, and it's usually seen in a darkened room during a sort of seance, and this is the way that the paranormal can physically manifest themselves in our world. So basically, what I'm saying is that this is supposed to be the moment that an evil entity is making themselves known in our world. Thankfully, at the end of the contact with the spirit, the ectoplasm will usually disappear as it returns to the entity, so it hopefully didn't stay around long, but this photo sure is something. In our number 3 spot today, we have the isolator. There are tons of strange inventions from the past. We have entire lists and videos dedicated to the strange inventions, there's so many. And while this is one that can be added to the list of bizarre inventions, it can also be added to the list of creepy ones as well. This photo shows what was meant to be a sort of anti-distraction contraption from the 1920s. Listen. I can get easily distracted, so sometimes I need a little help, but this thing really takes it to a new level. It essentially makes it impossible for the person to look at anything other than what is directly in front of them, or you know, breathe. It seems like a contraption that requires an oxygen tank hookup probably isn't going to be the best anti-distraction device. In fact, I think that's probably more distracting than anything. Honestly, I'm such a good procrastinator that even with this thing, I still wouldn't get my work done. Thankfully, this device didn't stick around or gain much popularity, and now it is just a terrifying relic of the past. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Great Manta. In 1933, a New York silk manufacturer named A. L. Kahn was on a nice little vacation in Florida when he honestly accidentally caught something remarkable. His anchor line, by mistake, caught onto a giant manta ray. After a struggle and several hours, Khan was able to get this actually enormous fish ashore. This monster was somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and was 20 feet and 5 inches in width. For reference, there are other giant manta rays, but they usually grow to be around 13 to 14 feet wide, not 20 and a half. This photo is showing a taxidermy version of the the fish, which Khan used to bring around to exhibitions to show off his accidental cash. In an article from December 10th, 1933 of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch's Sunday Magazine, Khan is quoted as saying, Fishing is a lot of fun when you catch the fish, and sometimes it's fun even when you don't, but when the fish catches you. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the advertisement. This is a photo that comes to us from the time of World War II, and it shows a very terrifying kind of ad. The sign reads, These men didn't take their Adabrine, and at first I had absolutely no idea what that was. Turns out that Adabrine was actually the first synthetic form of a drug which was used by the US military to fight malaria in the South Pacific during the war. It is estimated that as many as two thirds of the troops fell ill with malaria. This sign is said to have been posted outside of a military hospital in New Guinea and was meant to serve as a warning for those who didn't take the medicine, warning that the skulls on top would be the fate that awaited them. Perhaps a little dark, but creative and likely effective nonetheless. At the very least, the ad is definitely quite clear. Kicking off our list at number 10, the Pioneer's Defense. Right off the bat, yeah, look at this one. I don't have to explain why it's creepy.
creepy in any way. A whole town appears to be wearing gas masks. Yeah, you could probably guess which era this is. This image was captured in 1937 by Russian photographer Viktor Bula. Adapting to new safety regulations these last few years have been challenging, no doubt about that. But in 1937, if you wanted to join the Young Pioneers, which is the Soviet version of the Boy Scouts, well, you had to wear these huge gas masks and part of military preparation. Yeah, welcome to Boy Scouts. Grab a button and then put this vacuum cleaner on your face. Enjoy, break a leg. It's gonna hurt your back a bit. This photo is haunting. It's from the Leningrad area and it happened while dictator Stalin was still in charge. These masks are so haunting to look at. We see them after the fact, but to see them being worn in real time in that photo, I don't know. Maybe this photo gets me because we can't see anybody's faces or ages right? Makes you paint the picture yourself. Either way, let's move on to some clown stuff, shall we? Number nine, 1910 clowns. Yeah, they existed back then and they were much worse. Here's a fun fact. I didn't know this, but back in 2016, a study was done and it turns out Americans fear clowns more than they fear death. Mind you, this was at the height of the clown craze back in America, but a poll was conducted by the Morning Consult in 2016, and it shows that 42% of Americans said they were in some capacity afraid of clowns. 42%. So if this is you, you may want to skip to the next one. I'll beat you there. No problem. This photo was from 1910, and it appears to be a, well, a jolly good time, right? Two clowns for the price of one. Nice. What a great deal. Let's go. Now what's terrifying about this photo, I'll admit, is that the clown on the right is much larger larger than the clown on the left. If you have a fear of giants, well, you're screwed here, really. Nowhere you can go. Just a tall clown and a little clown. There's clowns everywhere. I don't like clowns. Number eight, Annalise Mikkel. If you've seen or heard of the 2005 horror film, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, this one here should ring a bell. This is the OG photo. How scary is that? Annalise Mikkel was a devout Catholic living a normal life with her parents in Germany. This was back in the late 1960s, but seemingly out of nowhere, she began to black out before showing strange behaviors. And when I say strange behaviors, I mean she would hallucinate and eat spiders. Stuff like that. Yeah, it was pretty scary. It was also extremely unhealthy, but ultimately Annalise claimed to be possessed by the devil, and her parents soon had to agree. Cut to 67 exorcisms later, Annalise sadly died of malnutrition at age 23 in 1976. And like I mentioned at the start of this point, her story was so widely known and shocking that it eventually inspired the 2005 horror film The Exorcism of Emily Rose, which I have seen, and it is very scary. All real. Turns out, sleep in fear. Number seven, the fire. This is a photo that comes to us from 2003. Not quite vintage, but still old enough. I'm 28, yeah, where's time going? I don't know. This one came from the station nightclub back in Rhode Island, and it shows the band Great White as they perform. Now, while this may seem like just a regular photo that somebody took on their Motorola Razor, what ensued shortly after this photo was taken is absolutely horrifying and tragic. Basically, as the band performed, there were some pyrotechnics that were set off, and they were meant to be a spectacular spectacular display, but they only ended up coming out as a disaster. See, the fireworks ended up setting all of the flammable acoustic foam in the walls and the ceiling all around them on fire. And it happened fast too, within one minute. Everything that was combustible ended up going in flames fast. Within two minutes, the entire club was fully engulfed in black smoke and people were having trouble finding exits. It was crowded, right? In the end, this fire took the lives of 100 people and another 230 were injured as a result. It has since gone down in US history as one of the worst and most deadly nightclub fires. Yeah, we look at Ball the Burning Men and think of what happened there. This is basically a 2003 version of that. More people, more flammable stuff, more pyrotechnics and unfortunately, more deaths. Number six, the Titanic. We all know the story of the Titanic. I mean, Olivia hasn't seen the movie, but we'll get to that later. It's one of the most famous in history, and this photo comes from just before that historic iceberg encounter. On April 10th, 1912, the Titanic set sail on its maiden voyage, heading from Southampton over to New York City. Now, the ship took a couple stops along the way, one in France and the other in Ireland before setting off ultimately for the United States officially. Now, somewhere along the beginning part of its journey, somebody was able to snap a photo of the ship as it sailed away. Now, it's not clear exactly where this photo was taken because it's old and there's a lot of water, but it's thought to be the last photo of the ship ever before its tragic end. Considering it was only four days after the ship set sail that it hit the iceberg, it is likely that this photo came not too long before that terrible day. So yeah, they're probably right. This was probably the last photo. Number five, Oroville Dam. On February 13th, 2017 in Oroville, California, the Oroville Dam, which is the tallest dam in the United States that holds back a reservoir that contains 1.1 trillion gallons of water, well that dam's main emergency spillways were damaged. This led to the emergency evacuation of 188,000 people 
control over concerns that the damages emergency spillway might just fail at this point. This was all caused by torrential rain and floods in the region, which then began to reveal the extensive damage in said spillway. This photo here shows the dam releasing 100,000 cubic feet of water per second into the main spillway. This is a feat of engineering, if anything. Now, luckily, a major disaster was avoided in the situation because of quick action by those responsible, but to see it unfold and to see how fierce it is, I don't like water or pressure or dams or history. Let's move on. Number four, the lipstick killer. This is a photo that comes to us from December 10th, 1945. Now, if looking at this image gives you a, you know, a weird shudder or chill down your spine, you got instincts, nice. You've heard about this in some way, or yeah, you read the title, you know it's some bad stuff coming. This was written by a terrible person known as the lipstick killer. This photo is an image of a note that he left written on the wall at one of his crime scenes. Now, the photo comes from the apartment of Francis Brown, as just before he wrote this message, he as you would have guessed, took her life, sadly. After this message was left, he ended up taking the life of another person because he was finally caught by police six months later. The message, put in the photo, reads, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Yeah, the lipstick killer wrote that. It's the scariest thing I ever heard. It's an absolute chilling note with a horrifying backstory. A lot of killers are getting their Netflix specials now, so I'm sure it's only time before he gets one. Number three, eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a stratovolcano located in Washington. Now, the volcano is best known, of course, for its huge and disastrous eruption on May 18th, 1980. And we have a photograph of it, and it's very scary. This photograph comes from photographer Robert Landsberg, who, of course, was unfortunately in the area at the time of the eruption. Now, before the eruption, he had visited the area in order to photograph and document all the changes that were happening. Didn't expect this one. On May 18th, he was within a few miles of the volcano when it did erupt. Now, since he unfortunately was located so close to the eruption, he knew he wouldn't be able to escape this disaster. So instead of focusing on the impossible, he focused on taking as many photos as possible, just like a historian at the end of his life, really. Robert was obviously incredibly brave and dedicated, and also very smart. After snapping as many photos as he could, including this one, he then secured his camera in his backpack and covered his backpack with his body. Protected history. It's like he knew he was unlikely to survive, but he still wanted to make sure that these photos did. That's why I have so important for me to bring it in this list today. His body was found 17 days later with his backpack still underneath him, plan did work, and his film was of course developed and has provided geologists with some really valuable insights with this close documentation of the eruption. So historically, it's a feat, but also scientifically, it's one as well. Number two, acid drum. This photo comes to us from the inside of the house of, well, you guessed it, another terrible person. The serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, we all know him. This photo was taken from the inside of his home right after he was found and caught by authorities. Now, before his arrest, he was sadly able to take the lives of 17 individuals. Now, although this photo may look kind of plain, dare I say, the horrors behind it are plentiful. This shot is simple. It shows a drum full of acid that was located inside of his home. You can only imagine the horrors. I don't need to tell you what this was used for, obviously. And I can't imagine the horrors that investigators saw when they first arrived to his house. Even investigating the crimes is one thing, but to show up and see this it's too much. Thankfully, Jeffrey was caught, and in 1992, he was sentenced to life in prison, but just two years later, he was killed by a fellow prison inmate. Insert Kirby Enthusiasm music. And finally, number one, Europe flood. This photo comes to us from the summer of 2022, as people across Western Europe experienced disastrous flooding. Now, after days of heavy raining, it ended up turning rivers that were usually normal and calm into these raging currents that ravaged the streets, and sadly left cars and power lines just being swept away. Homes, too. They got engulfed, and residents were trapped inside. This photo was taken in Erfstadt, which is just southwest of Cologne, and it shows how a bunch of houses collapsed due to subsidence, which is the sun sinking of the ground surface below. Now, unfortunately, these floods caused many people to lose their lives, mostly in Germany, but these were sadly dozens of people in Belgium as well, pretty much everywhere, bigger than we thought initially, all which was an absolute tragedy. Rescue workers worked tirelessly to help as many people as possible escape this terrible situation. I couldn't even imagine responding to this, let alone being caught up in it, that's terrible. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the burst of joy. You might be looking at this photo wondering how this extremely joyous photo could hold any dark secrets. Well, this photo won a Pulitzer Prize and for a very good reason. The photo was captured by Slava Vedder on March 17th, 1973 at the Travis Air Force Base in California. The photo shows United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Sturm and his family. This was taken as he was being reunited with his family after five years 
years of being held as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. On October 27th, 1967, he was leading a flight of F-105s when he was shot down over Hanoi and held captive until March 14th, 1973. I can't imagine what this must have been like for his family because there was a chance that he could have not come home at all. The girl with her arms wide open is his daughter, but the looks on all of their faces truly captures the pure joy that they are all feeling. In our number 9 spot today, we have the reflecting pool. This is one of the creepiest or chilling images ever taken. It depicts a young girl in a graveyard who is looking down at her reflection in a pond. Okay, maybe a little eerie, but not exactly chilling. What really makes this photo what it is, however, is that there are seemingly two reflections looking back up at the little girl. No one knows who the girl is, where she is, or when this photo was taken, but it is estimated to have come from somewhere around the early 1900s. The photo was analyzed, and it has been said that it is unaltered or edited. Who knows how this photo was possible? Maybe there was some sort of invisible entity standing beside her that we could only see in the reflection, like a reverse vampire or something. In our number 8 spot today, we have the neighborhood nuclear test. This photo shows a mother and her young son looking out the window and witnessing a nuclear test explosion from the comfort of their own home in 1953. Like. What? Imagine seeing that from your window now in 2023. People would be going wild. And of course, any kind of nuclear test should be done as far away from where people live as possible. I know it's not like the test was being done in their front yard or anything, but I still certainly wouldn't be comfortable with them testing a nuclear device anywhere near the place I live. This photo was of course taken before the effects of nuclear radiation from these kinds of explosions were publicly understood. Actually, people have suggested that the public not knowledge of these kinds of side effects were suppressed during this time in order to avoid controversy about them testing these kinds of weapons in your neighborhood. Well, that would of course be something insane to witness firsthand. Thankfully, the now widely known health risks associated with this sort of thing has caused this to not be a common occurrence anymore. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Boston Marathon. This photo comes to us from 1967 and it depicts the struggles that Catherine Switzer went through in order to be the first female to finish the Boston marathon. The photo shows race organizers as well as other participants trying to stop her from running the marathon that she had trained for and was more than capable of completing. She has written a book that explains in great detail all of the things she went through that day and how the critiques and opinions about a woman running the race started even before she had registered to run. People in our history like Catherine are very important as well as photos like these because they show when people were literally trying to drag her down, she just kept on running. In our number 6 spot today, we have the reenactment. This photo is extremely unsettling, and for a very good reason. If, when you look at this photo, your instincts tell you that the guy in them is creepy, ding ding ding! You're right. This is a photo that features the German serial killer Joachim Kroll. He is known for taking the lives of 14 people, all varying in age, and he is also known for consuming parts of their flesh. This monster was caught in 1976, and he was discovered when police found out that he had been clogging the plumbing in his apartment with the remains of one of his victims. How gruesome is that? This photo was taken shortly after he was caught and arrested, and what you're seeing is Kroll reenacting one of his crimes for the police. I get goosebumps just thinking about that. I couldn't imagine being there or being the police officer that he's on top of. Talk about terrifying. I'm just glad that they caught him and got him off the street. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Stanley Hotel. This is a photo of the Stanley Hotel, which is the hotel that inspired the famous Stephen King novel. The Shining. This hotel was under construction in the early 1900s and saw a fateful day in 1911. There was an unexplained explosion that happened in room 217. In the explosion, a chambermaid was seriously injured, but she did end up surviving and she actually returned to work. A few years later, she passed away and ever since her passing, there have been tons of guests who swear that they saw her ghost. Guests have said that they have seen her around the halls of the hotel, but the place that gets the most paranormal normal activity is of course room 217. This is the room where Stephen King and his wife stayed for one terrifying night in 1974. Apparently they were actually the only guests at the hotel.
yourself for this night, which at any other hotel might be kind of cool, but I feel like this is not what you want from a haunted hotel. In our number four spot today, we have the Rothschild Surrealist Ball. The Rothschild family is one of the wealthiest and most powerful families there has ever been. For years and years, there have been many rumors swirling about just how powerful and influential they really are, and there are some pretty crazy theories out there. In 1972, the family held a Surrealist Ball, which is where this photo comes from. These photos could potentially be very innocent, but there is just something about these very elaborate masks, coupled with the theories about what this family is really up to that just makes it feel very eerie. I know it's kind of like conspiracy feeling, but I don't know. There's something very haunting about this. This party is one of the most legendary there has ever been, and whether or not they really are involved in shady dealings, that still is pretty impressive. In our number three spot today, we have John Lennon. Of course, we all know John Lennon as one part of the Beatles who went on after they disbanded to have a very successful solo career. Lennon was not only a musician, but he was also a peace activist who was strongly anti-war. He was not afraid to display his activism and held a two-week anti-war demonstration. There was a period of three years where the Nixon administration was trying to have him deported for his criticism against the Vietnam War. That's how active he was. On December 8th, 1980, Lennon was leaving the Dakota apartment complex when he was stopped by a man named Mark David Chapman. Lennon signed an autograph for Mark, which is what is happening in this photo, and then Lennon went on his way. Little did he know, Mark was going to shoot him later that night. Once Lennon returned to the apartment complex, Mark was there waiting for him to commit his crime. Mark has said he did it mostly for attention, which is very horrifying, but Mark is also a very religious man who explained that Lennon once saying that the Beatles were more famous than Jesus is what really pushed him to commit this crime. It is very crazy that this photo was captured when Lennon was being so kind to who he thought was a fan, and no one would have ever predicted what would happen just a few hours later. In our number two spot today, we have the Hindenburg. This is a photo that was taken during what is now known as the Hindenburg disaster. It is commonly known that blimps, or these kinds of floating airships, use helium in them to float through the air, and it's important to note that helium isn't the choice because it's the only option, but rather because it's one of the safest options, and that is due to the fact that it isn't extremely volatile. Because of a US ban on the exportation of helium at the time, i.e. the Helium Control Act of 1925, although the Hindenburg was designed to use helium, there was a lack of it available, so on the day of the Hindenburg disaster, the much more flammable hydrogen was used instead, and this led to well, complete disaster. When the Hindenburg floated off on May 6th, 1937, it disastrously caught fire during its flight with 97 people on board. Sadly, due to the fire, there were 35 casualties on board the flight that day. It is an absolutely horrendous situation, which teaches us all a very valuable lesson. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have Mount Pinatubo. This is a photo that is showing Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines on June 15th, 1991. That is the day that this volcano erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Certainly impressive, also extremely terrifying. This photo shows the pyroclastic flow full of hot gas and rock being flung into the air. Eruptive activity at the volcano first started on April 2nd of that year, which prompted researchers to set up seismographs in the area. By June, the volcano was having a couple of progressively shallower eruptions before, on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent an ash column 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Additionally, smaller explosions continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. After more highly gas-charged magma reached the surface, on June 15th, the volcano once again exploded, this time sending the cloud of ash 40 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the surrounding areas and pyroclastic flows filled what were once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits. It was truly magnificent and extremely powerful, and this photo shows just that. I don't know about you guys, man, but like, Mother Nature, I'm afraid of her, all right? Number 10, Russian Bigfoot caught on tape. The exact location of where this video was taken is still unknown. In fact, there isn't a ton known about this video at all, but 
what is known is that it was taken somewhere in Russia. That's about it. And people actually believe that it captures the real Bigfoot or one of the many Bigfoots out there. This is the Russian one. They got a Russian Bigfoot. What do we all think here? I wanted to start with one of the most insane videos I could find. I think I nailed it. How'd I do? I don't know. This one comment dives in further. The user says the title of the original video was called Chichuna, but in Russian script. The creature hops sometimes sideways like a lemur. Of course, lemurs have tails, which make that type of movement easier. And Chichunas are sometimes described as having tails, but this creature doesn't appear to have one, does it? No, it looks like a, a blob of scariness. I don't even know. The original footage was in all Russian and claimed to have been shot in Siberia. It also featured a boy and a dog in the foreground who didn't appear to be all that concerned, but I still believe this footage to be genuine. That's one of the top comments, so. You know, someone did their research. Number nine, overnight visitor. Oh, this one definitely gives me the chills. I don't like it. This video was taken from a surveillance camera that was placed inside of a couple's home. Not outside, inside. This is scary. And this, I hope this never happens to anybody watching this video. The footage caught something while they were both asleep. And it's one of the creepiest things that I've ever seen. When the couple woke up the next day, they were unable to find a purse that they knew was in the home right before they went to sleep. So they decided to check their security cameras and this is what they found. As they were sleeping, a man crept in and was so quiet that he didn't wake them or their dogs up. No, he stood at the top of the stairs watching them sleep for a few minutes, which just adds another layer of Ew, to this whole scenario. Yeah, always check those nooks and crannies before you go to sleep, I guess. Number eight, Titanic inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be creepy about an inspection card, you ask? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers that went down with the ship. Now, the card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed, and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. Yeah, you can see the word majestic is literally crossed out of her card. You know, adds to the creepy element because it shows her literal change in plans. Number seven, Norway lights. Natural light phenomena is common in our big, beautiful planet. The northern lights, the green flash, solar eclipses, you name it. I bet those were all pretty alarming back in ancient times. Now, some of these natural events look otherworldly. They look cosmic, almost. Most of the time, there's an explanation, wait, but for the mysterious glowing orbs floating over Norway, the Hasdalen lights, as locals call them, we still need some answers. Scientists have been trying to gather research, and in 2014, after many impressive light shows, their best guess is a natural battery that charges underground, and then emits this light show above. Maybe this has something to do with the uh, reoccurring lights over Phoenix. Could be the same phenomena happening, who knows. Number six, the cool time traveler. Do you believe in time travel? If your answer is no, maybe this next one, maybe it'll change your mind or keep you open to the concept. It's a common theme in movies, Back to the Future, Loopers, Avengers. Time travel plots are fun, but they're absolute nonsense. Or are they? When we see a case like the Cape Scott story, we can't help but be intrigued a little bit. Time travel or not, this is an interesting photo. It comes from Ray Peterson's book, The Great Cape Scott Story. That book was from 1974, but the actual photo used in the book was taken over 100 years ago. And in the photo, it shows this modern looking guy rocking shorts, maybe jorts, who knows? He has messy morning surfer hair, dippity do, three hold, you know, that kind of stuff. He doesn't look like he's from that time period at all. This also has happened more than once, like the time traveling hipster. I don't know, I'm pretty sure that's my cousin. That looks like a guy I know. Definitely not a guy from the 1900s, that's for sure. Number five, skunk ape. This one is exactly what it sounds like. The skunk ape was seen back in 2000, so hopefully, if it's a real thing, it's long gone. Hopefully it's dead by now, it's pretty gross. Two photos were taken of the supposed skunk ape, and this thing looks like Bigfoot's cooler, older cousin, you know? That cousin who has a lava lamp, does kickflips in the garage in October, that kind of cousin, that's the skunk ape, really. An anonymous source sent the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department these photos. They mailed them in, which for starters, that's pretty jarring to receive. Just a creature, just a Bigfoot, put it in the mail. But she claims these photos were taken in her actual backyard and that this creature was not a black bear. It wasn't anything we've seen before. I personally don't think that's a black bear. If anything, it's just a really large, odd looking dog. Those teeth alone are a red flag either way. I want nothing to do with that. Number four, Solway Spaceman caught on photo. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos, some dude sneezing in the background while you're, you know, having the moment of your life. It's the best, we love it. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in an otherwise empty marsh, 
long before Photoshop existed. It appears an astronaut just crashed the family moment. He just had to pop up in the photo in the background. Now, Jim assures us that nobody was around, which I believe, otherwise, what a weird photo to take in an empty field. I'd be like, hi, get away from my daughter. Just, yeah, 17 meters to the left, thanks. Also, the fact that this man looks like he's from space. Yeah, that makes it more believable, no? What are we looking at right now? Who is this? It's so, so creepy. Kodak even got involved in this story, right? Like Kodak, the company Kodak. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with and they know everything. They made Avatar, so they know what's up. Let's run everything by Kodak from now on, deal? Number three, Worstead Church Visitor. Okay, time to get a little paranormal. We love those. Hit the lights. Back in 1975, Peter and Diane Berthelot were visiting the Worstead Church in the UK. It was beautiful, right? So like any visitor does, Peter, took a photo with his nice Kodak camera, right? He wants to see the truth with his Kodak. Peter took a photo of his lovely wife sitting in this spectacle of a church, but later on, once the photo was developed, somebody else was all of a sudden in the photo now. Or something, we don't really know. Right on the bench behind Diane, there appears to be a person in all white. How calming is that? Maybe it's a wedding, maybe it's their big day. We love it. When the couple went back to the church to ask about who it was, a local suggested they may have gotten photo proof of the white lady, the spirit of a healer who haunts the church. I mean, I mean, as far as surprise ghosts go, that's pretty tame. That's a pretty tame encounter. That's how it should be. Could have been a lot worse. They're like, oh, that's the demon. That's Daryl the demon. Yeah, you don't want any part of that. Number two, Black Knight Satellite. Not to be confused with Martin Lawrence Black Knight. That's, you know, although that's pretty historical and memorable in itself. The Black Knight Satellite is something that has been orbiting our planet for God knows how long. We're guessing thousands of years. Everything else on this list is quite recent, but this myth is ancient. This photo here, you've probably seen at one point or another. It was taken back in 1998 during an American mission to the International Space Station. Apparently this guy has been hovering over our Earth just watching us. It's some sort of alien satellite. That's a fun theory, no doubt about it. But during a spacewalk in 1998, one of the thermal covers came loose and drifted away from the station. Could this be that cover that just floated off and wrapped itself around a rock or something? Or it could be an ancient night satellite. One of the two. And finally, number one, the doorbell liquor. Nice, we gotta end with the weirdest thing I've ever seen. This one's short and sweet. Not much explaining to do here, obviously. Does what it says in the can. Back in 2019, a man was caught on surveillance, a doorbell camera, approaching a home in a neighborhood in Salinas, California. He doesn't say much, he just shows up. Doesn't drop off any package, nothing like that. He just shows up and uh, starts licking the doorbell. Not the camera, but the actual doorbell, like the button. He must have rang the bell hundreds of times because he did this for three hours straight. His jaw muscles must be insane. The homeowner said in a following interview after seeing set footage, uh, I quote, oh boy, that is just weird. Yeah, that's what they said to that footage for three hours of a man licking their doorbell. They're like, oh boy, that's weird. If that was me, I'd move. I'd be halfway packing. I'd be like, oh boy, that's weird. Grab a box, let's go. We're moving. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a stratovolcano located in Skamania County, Washington. This volcano is best known for its huge and disastrous eruption on May 18, 1980. This photograph comes from photographer Robert Landsberg, who of course was in the area at the time of the eruption. Before the eruption, he had visited the area in order to photograph and document all of the changes that were happening. On May 18, he was within a few miles of the volcano when it erupted. Since he unfortunately was located so close to the explosion, he knew he would be unable to escape this disaster, so instead of focusing on the impossible, he focused on taking as many pictures as possible. Robert was obviously incredibly brave and dedicated, but also very smart. After snapping as many photos as he could, including this one, he then secured his camera in his backpack and covered his backpack with his body. He knew he was unlikely to survive, but wanted to make sure sure that these photos did. His body was found 17 days later with his backpack still underneath him. His film was of course, um, his film was of course developed and has provided geologists with some really valuable insights with his close documentation of the eruption. In our number nine spot today, we have the core. This photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew. And while this looks like a relatively normal, non-threatening photo, what he has in his hand is truly devastating. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man Atomic Bomb. This means that Harold is holding the nuclear core of the atomic bomb that was later dropped 
on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast of course took many lives, but so did the long term effects of the bomb, like radiation illness and that sort of thing. It's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems just so perfectly normal when he literally has a life changing, world ending device in the palm of his hand. Also, I don't think I could ever hold something like that. Not only would I just like not want to, but I would just be so afraid that something was gonna go wrong. In our number 8 spot today we have the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the clearly very excited Challenger crew as they walked down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. The crew even included 37 year old Krista McAuliffe who was a high school social studies teacher. She had won a spot on this mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space program and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first non-military person in space. On January 28, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fatal just 73 seconds after liftoff. Two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures of the morning and on live television, the world watched as the spacecraft broke apart and plunged into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everyone on board. It is an absolutely tragic event made even more chilling by this final photo. In our number 7 spot today we have the plague. This photo comes from the 19th century from the third plague pandemic. This was the first time that the plague had spread to all five continents. While we now know something about what that might have been like, what we haven't had to endure are the doctors that dressed like this. This is a photo of the outfits and masks that plague doctors wore when they would come to your house to treat or diagnose you. The long beak like noses of the masks are very creepy, but they were used to hold herbs and other nicely scented things because they believed that it would help ward off the bad air which at the time is what they thought was causing the sickness. A pandemic certainly is bad enough, thankfully our doctors and nurses are just sticking to scrubs. In our number 6 spot today we have the elephant's foot. This photo looks like it's just a big lump of nothing but it's called an elephant's foot. Don't worry at first I was a little worried too but it has nothing to do with elephants and is only named that because of its appearance. This lump was actually created from the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown and it is just a mass of corium and other materials that were in the core of the reactor. This elephant's foot was located in the steam distribution corridor which is under what's left of the reactor. While this mass doesn't produce as much radiation as it did before, it does still to this day produce a deadly amount. It is said that if you stood in front of it for just 300 seconds, that would be enough to get a lethal dose of radiation. It's kind of crazy that even though they knew this, they were still standing there taking pictures of it. But I'm just glad because we all now get to see it and it gives us just a little more insight into what exactly happened that day. In our number 5 spot today we have Mount Pinatubo. This is a photo that is showing Mount Pinatubo which is located in the Philippines on June 15, 1991. That is the day that this volcano erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Certainly impressive, also extremely terrifying. This photo shows the pyroclastic flow full of hot gas and rock being flung into the air. Eruptive activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd of that year, which prompted researchers to set up seismographs in the area. By June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions before on June 12th the volcano had its first spectacular eruption which sent an ash column 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere. After more highly gas charged magma reached the surface on June 15th the volcano once again exploded this time sending the cloud of ash 40 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the surrounding area and pyroclastic flows filled what were once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits. It was truly magnificent and extremely powerful and this photo shows just that. In our number 4 spot today we have the Pioneer's Defense. This photo is known as the Pioneer's Defense and man does it ever look creepy. This photo comes from 1937 and it was taken by a Russian photographer named Viktor Bulla. This photo takes place in the Leningrad area which is now known as St. Petersburg which is the second largest city in Russia. The people in this photo were part of a group that was the 1930s Russian equivalent of our boy Boy Scouts and it was called the Young Pioneers. The masks on their faces leave a very eerie feeling and for a fair reason. These people were doing a military preparation drill which is the reason for the gas mask. 
masks. This photo was taken during a time where the country was under the dictatorship of Joseph Stalin, and the residents were constantly unsure of what was going to happen. The country was already seeing death, and people were already frightened just a few years before the start of World War II. In our number three spot today, we have the lipstick. This is a photo that comes to us from December 10th, 1945. If looking at this image gives you a shudder down your spine, that absolutely makes sense as it was written by a terrible person known as the lipstick killer. This photo is an image of a note he left written on the wall at one of his crime scenes. The photo comes from the apartment of Francis Brown as just before he wrote this message, he took her life. After this message was left, he ended up taking the life of one other person before he was finally caught by police six months later. The message scrawled in the photo reads, quote, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. It is an absolutely chilling note with a horrifying backstory. In our number two spot today, we have the acid drum. This photo comes to us from inside the house of another terrible person, the serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer, made very famous recently. This photo was taken from the inside of his home after he was found out and caught by authorities. Before his arrest, he was sadly able to take the lives of 17 different people. Although this photo might look kind of plain, the horrors are plentiful. This shot shows a drum full of acid that was located inside of his home. Probably don't really need to tell you what it was used for. I can't imagine the horrors investigators saw when they entered his home, and even previous to that as they investigated his crimes. Thankfully, Jeffrey was caught, and in 1992, he was sentenced to life in prison, but just two years later, he was killed by a fellow prison inmate. In our number one spot today, we have the Dyatlov Pass incident. If you have never heard of the Dyatlov Pass incident, you better buckle in because it is so terrifying. This photo was taken in February of 1959 as nine young Soviet hikers sent out to trek through the Ural Mountains. They had set up a camp and sometime during the night, something happened that made them cut their way out of the tent and all flee the site. Leaving in such a rush, they were of course underdressed for the bitterly cold weather, and six of them ended up passing away from hypothermia, which is extremely tragic. The other three, however, is where this story takes an even more frightening turn. Like I mentioned before, no one knows why they fled the tent in the first place, and the last three hikers were found passed away with severe signs of physical trauma that no one agreed on what had caused it. In 2019, the investigation was reopened, and just last year, there was a conclusion that a kind of avalanche called a slab avalanche was the cause for these injuries. Before you come at me in the comments, I know that not everyone is convinced that's what happened, and I don't blame you. It's really strange. So, down below in the comments, let me know what you think. Let's solve this mystery once and for all together in the YouTube comments. Regardless of what happened, this whole incident was of course very tragic, but the mystery behind it definitely takes it to a very spooky place. Number 10, the isolator. The last thing anybody wants to do after the almost, almost two years we've had? Ugh. Though this looks like an object perfect for deep sea diving, it was actually built for desk work. Hugo Gernsback was a Luxembourgish American inventor, writer, editor, engineer, designer, businessman, and of course, magazine publisher, because why not add one more thing to the list he's really good at? He started a magazine called Science and Invention, which encouraged scientific and amateur experimentation. This was one of the inventions published in the magazine and was revealed in July 1925. The main purpose was to block out all of the noise from the surrounding environment, narrow the field of view, like horse blinders, to improve concentration. But don't worry, there was an oxygen tube attached to help out the study year, so you know, you could you could breathe while you're reading about Shakespeare or something. Number nine, kangaroo boxing. Link here. This next one looks pretty self-explanatory, but also it's very confusing at the exact same time. Kangaroo boxing actually became pretty popular in the 1800s. In both Europe and the United States, clowns and professional boxers would square off against marsupials in front of herds of people. It was actually started by a university professor just like as a joke and then it really caught on. Who they cheered for? One can't be certain. The man in the above photograph was sparring against a kangaroo in Germany in 1924. Obviously, the sport did not continue as it was considered abusive to animals who clearly had no idea why this hairless being was all up in their space and trying to beat them up. I don't understand. This is just ridiculous. Number eight, children shipped in the mail. Picture here. Sounds ridiculous is ridiculous. 
But did it happen? Of course it did. However, this picture was actually staged, but this actually did happen. Imagine your sister calling you and telling you your nephew is visiting, and then minutes later the doorbell rings and your nephew is just like chilling with some packing peanuts in a cardboard box. Well, not quite. The postman had to play a kind of babysitter a bit. Shortly after package delivery, a revolutionary thing on its own, was introduced, a couple in Ohio sent their infant son to their grandmother's via post in 1913. It cost 15 cents plus $50 insurance. Once this oddball story got out, the trend caught on. Regulations were vague about what you could and could not send via post, so why take a bus when you could take a postman? Rural townships also usually knew their postman really well, so they'd be like, oh come on Joey, here's 15 cents, take little Timmy to my aunts, I don't know. So they trusted them, they weren't just passing them off to strangers. However, eventually new regulations came out banning the practice. Finally, because it's just weird. <laughs> Number seven, mummies for sale. Considering the frenzy that people get into when archaeologists discover a new mummy, you might be surprised to learn that this picture is actually a street merchant selling mummy merchandise of actual, actual mummy. During the Victorian era in the 1800s, Napoleon's conquest opened the gates of Egypt to the Europeans, making mummies a really hot commodity. <laughs> like, imagine somebody. Bury, like uh, uncovering your aunt and going, ooh, we could sell her. Weird, right? Like thousand years from now? They could be purchased from street vendors, just as you see from this photo. The Euro elite used to even have mummy unwrapping parties, which is exactly as it sounds and not what you would expect people to do with a corpse. But even weirder than that, people actually thought ground up mummies had medicinal properties. It was so popular that it even instigated a counterfeit trade to meet the massive demand man for magic mummy ground stuff. What did the counterfeit trade involve? The flesh of beggars instead of mummies. All that behind one picture. Number six, half and half. This next one actually has a kind of sad story behind it, but paints a very clear picture of the division between Catholics and Protestants and actually just religion in general. This picture depicts two graves in the Netherlands, one belonging to a Protestant and the other a Catholic. In 1842, a 22-year-old Catholic noblewoman fell passionately in love with a 33-year-old commoner, a colonel in the cavalry who was also Protestant, a big no-no. Their marriage was a total scandal, but they said screw you to their peers and stayed together for 40 years. The woman's husband died in 1880 and to forever unite them, she built a grave that would forever keep them together even though they were apart by a wall. The old cemetery was strictly divided into Catholic, Protestant and Jewish sections so these two monuments were built so they could forever be together. Does anybody have a tissue? Number 5. Leo the Lion! Believe it or not, you've seen this lion before. In fact, you've probably seen him many times while watching your favorite films as a kid and even now. The lion in the photo is the one, the only, Leo the Lion, the majestic beast who roars the MGM logo, like the old one. Leo the Lion was the regular star of MGM since it was founded in 1924. The first MGM lion was called Slats, not Leo, and he actually didn't roar, he was just kind of like looking around, it was more like a gif. But Leo is actually the most familiar roar, like everybody knows what he sounds like. But who is the man having tea with such a lion? Well that of course is Alfred Hitchcock, the king of thrills. This photo was taken in 1957 of the two legends posing to enjoy a hot cup of British tea. Number 4, Walter Yeo. Though the picture itself is a little disturbing, it signifies a life changing moment for Mr. Walter Yeo and also for thousands more. This was one of the world's first plastic surgery procedures. Walter Yeo had suffered a dreadful accident while manning guns on the HMS Warspite during World War I. He lost both his upper and lower eyelids in the event. A year later, however, he met Sir Harold Gillies, who would be considered the father of plastic surgery. His idea was to take skin from another part of Yeo's body and place it over the area in like a mask-like shape as you can see in the photo. Dr. Gillies then went on to carry out the surgery on 5,000 injured men from June 1917 onward. And thanks to his work, thousands of people have benefited since the years of the war. Yeo himself lived until he was 70 years old. Number 3, the Dinosphere. The car of the future that really never made it there, and we can see why. 
every car we have today has four wheels, not just one. Some have more than that now, it's getting confusing. But in the 1930s, J.H. Purvis had a vision. He called it the Dynosphere. It was a large wheel with a cabin in the center for the driver and the passenger to sit. Funny enough, it did actually work. Check this out. But did anyone else notice the problem with driving it? Yeah. You have to drive like Ace Ventura with his window open because it broke, you know what I mean that scene? Exactly. In order to see past the giant wheel spinning in front of you, you have to kind of rubber neck it out to the side. J.H. made two prototypes, one ran on gasoline and the other ran on electricity. He even designed a kind of bus version that could fit more passengers, but it still needed mini stabilizer wheels, so it had like six by the end of it. Do I kind of want one though, because it looks fun? Absolutely. Would I want to take it on a road trip across Canada? Absolutely not. Number two, the Hindenburg disaster. Based off the title, you already know that this is a picture of the Hindenburg disaster because I already said it. Spoiler alert. The Hindenburg was the largest dirigible ever built and it was the pride of World War II. Yeah, see, Germany, you know which one I'm talking about. The, but YouTube gets mad. The first successful airship was constructed in 1852 by Henry Giffard, but the problem was he used hydrogen. This made both French and German designs of the craft susceptible to explosions if something went wrong. Hence, exhibit A. What you are seeing in the photo is the direct aftermath of a devastating accident. Um, on May 6, 1937, the dirigible touched a mooring mast in Lakehurst, New Jersey, sparking the explosion, which took the lives of 13 passengers and 21 crew members. Something as simple as a small spark from the engine ignited the hydrogen core, and the craft fell 200 feet to the ground in flames. And last but not least, number one, spectators. This is the photo taken at the trial of Al Capone. Yeah, it suddenly makes a lot of sense as to why people are covering their faces. When someone says to you 1930s gangster, Al Capone probably jumps into your head. He was deemed public enemy number one by the US government for bootlegging and other illegal rackets during prohibition. The terror the ruthless gangster incited in the city of Chicago is evident by this image. Witnesses and spectators of the trial covered their faces so they wouldn't be recognized by Capone's vengeful accomplices or Capone himself. Behind those fedoras may lie other criminals yet to be unmasked, or civilians scared of a Tommy gun waking them up at night. Either way, you know he must have been one terrifying dude. Authorities did everything they could to catch him, but he would always slip right through their fingers. Finally, his reign came to an end in 1931 when they caught him on income tax evasions of all things that landed him an eight year sentence. Number 10, the cube. All right, Transformers fans, let's do this. I feel like we're hearing more about these things like UFOs or UAPs, whatever you want to call them now. I feel like we're hearing about them now more than ever. So why not kick this weird list off with something off world? We have to include some alien cover ups, right? It's me, it's Taylor, why not? I figured that I'd find one that's also not too well known. We haven't seen this one you know on YouTube all the time. Not too long ago, this spinning cube looking craft or drone or something, it was spotted over Missouri, just lurking in the same spot, just hovering. And then it would zoom off. Folks could see it with their naked eye on the ground. It was also pretty obvious. It was eye grabbing, it was shiny in the sky. Only a couple hours later, it was seen again, but this time it was 700 miles away. This time it was 44 year old Matthew Jandeka. He was minding his own business, hanging out on the porch, just doing his you know Sunday, Sunday stuff. When this cube, again, this floaty cube caught his attention. It was a sunny day, the light reflecting off the cube caught his eye, but then a day later, another guy, 30 year old Justin Johnson, he saw the same thing, but this time he saw it while he was driving home, which is also pretty distracting. The light and the reflections also caught his eye. He says, at first I thought maybe it was a balloon, but the movements were too odd. In a world full of deep fakes, I mean, do we believe this account? Is this real? Lately everyone's talking about how these UFOs are spheres, so maybe this video is that of a sphere. Not a cube, that's cool. I love teaching geometric shapes via alien aircraft. I'm like, this is a triangle. We saw this one in the Navy. Then we saw this cube in the sky. Number nine, Amityville photo. Okay, we'll go less UFOs, more ghosts. One M. Night Shyamalan theme to the other. Here we go. This photo was taken inside the actual Amityville house back in 1976. It's a young man, it appears, with glowing white eyes. How comforting is that? Pretty, pretty hard to miss there. He's got the glowing, 
Yeah, it looks very Sin City of him, just to stare with those white eyes. Now, at first, I thought this was from a horror movie, right? All those Amityville knockoffs. It looks obviously fake or set up in some way, until you start to read about the details here. See, this photo, it was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared, not an actual person. So, this young lad here probably wasn't expecting a selfie. Why I wasn't smiling or throwing up a peace sign. Makes sense now. Photographer Gene Campbell set up the photo and took it back in 1976. Now, at the time, Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren on the actual case. Huh. I'm scared now. This photo was revealed three years after it was taken on the Merv Griffin show, and many believe this is the ghost of John DeFeo, one of the victims in 1974. Now, you can't really do this anymore, right? You can't whip out photos from a otherwise crime scene and be like, okay gang, what do we think? Spirit or not a spirit? Vote, yes, no. Obviously there was backlash after this for obvious reasons, but it took three years for that photo to reach the public eye, and now everybody believes in ghosts, or they do a little more than they did before that show. This was long before The Conjuring movie as well, obviously, so this was quite random to see on TV. Do you believe in ghosts? What's the ratio here? Comment down below. I'm not a believer, I'm not gonna lie. I've tried numerous times. I got the Ouija board, did the whole thing. Felt nothing, man. Like an 18 year old on Christmas. I'm like, is that it? Is it done? Do I have to feel anything anymore? Number eight, Alfred Hitchcock and the MGM Lion. All right, you're gonna hear me roar after this one. This photo was from 1958. You've seen this at some point, right? Hopefully, or else, you know, we'll send over a VHS, we'll help you out. It was taken by Clarence Sinclair Bull. Now the photo appears to be, well, no, it doesn't appear to be at all. It's Alfred Hitchcock serving tea to a lion. Yeah, the famous MGM lion. His name's Leo, that's him, there he goes, he's getting tea. He loves suspense and tea, who would have thought? And company, it appears. North by Northwest was the only film that Hitchcock did with MGM. So there's a rumor now that he directed the lion's roar for the MGM intro, which is fun. But you're also like, okay, that's a real animal, that's kinda, that's sad. And also, that's probably nonsense. There have been seven MGM lions in total. Yeah, not just one, but Leo was known to be the most friendly. I wanna hear about the other six. I'm like, what happened there? He's still in the logo today. Today, but again, back in the 1950s, it's hard to say what it was really like on set. I mean, it's still a lion being held down for a photo, so probably wasn't a friendly vibe for that fella. Number seven, Gloria Steinem. Oh, here we go, a scandalous one. Back in 1963, the Playboy Club in New York City was booming. It was one of Hugh Hefner's greatest accomplishments at the time. This club was the talk of the town. That is until Gloria Steinem came in and started reporting some stuff. Gloria was a feminist writer. She's an icon. She created Miss Magazine back in 1972, but her career began much earlier around the 60s. See, she got a job as one of these Playboy bunnies, you know. Must be a comfortable get up. And she worked at the club undercover, secretly taking note on how this key holders only <sighs> establishment was operating, right? Cool, what's going on here? What's the big scoop here? The staff were these young women, these beautiful young women, these bunnies. They had to wear the black bodysuits, the puffy white tails, the whole get up. And at age 28, Gloria worked undercover there for three weeks straight. And the piece she released after, appropriately titled A Bunny's Tale, Great title, by the way, she nailed that one. It got so much attention that it kickstarted her freelance career and also made her a feminist icon. This photo of Gloria undercover shows you the comfortable work outfits she had to endure just to get the story out. Yeah, doesn't look like she had her non-slips on there. That's, that's a write-up in my books. In a collection of her writings, Gloria reflects on the undercover piece, saying that it now has outlived all of the Playboy clubs, both here and abroad. That was before Hefner passed away in 2017, so I will add that you also outlived him as well. Good, he wasn't a very nice lad. Let's move on. Number six, North Sentinel Island. All right, we've got some people, some aliens, some ghosts. What else do we need, Taylor? How about some weird islands? Sure. North Sentinel Island. We gotta head over to India for this one. This island is the home of the Sentinelese tribe. You've probably heard about this at some point. One of the most forbidden islands in the world, but why? Located in the Bay of Bengal, North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India. And while most islands are shrinking, this one actually grew back in 2014. Yeah, the universe is like more. Yeah, you need more of this, sure. The island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake, so the west and south sides, they gained an extra kilometer. Nice. DLC unlocked. The inhabitants on this island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. They have apparently been there for 50,000 years, and there's no sign of agriculture or even fire. Yet somehow this tribe has thrived for ages. Now, if we try and get close, they will try and drive anybody away. More than fair, like we have enough room, we're good. Let's just leave. In fact, back in 2006, two fishermen sadly lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it or what the island was. Yeah, you can't just approach random islands. You gotta do some homework. 
That's why I'm here. Number five, Laskow Cave. If you didn't visit this cave back in 1963 or sooner, well, you lost your chance because, well, humans ruin everything. Now we can't even see ancient art anymore because, well, it's too many of us. The Lascaux Cave System is now a World Heritage Site in France, but once it was a booming tourist attraction. These cave paintings, see, they're 17,300 years old. They're quite ancient. We can't really touch them. You can't have someone write Steve was here on it. Can't do that. Paintings that depict cattle, bison, stags, you name it. They're beautiful. They're complex. And of course, like I said, they're extremely old. So old, in fact, that the cave was closed to the public forever in 1963 after it declared human presence wasn't healthy for the art. Yeah, our dirty coffee breath would eventually cause this art to fade away. So we had to hold our breath. We gotta leave. We gotta close it off. There we go. Plus, I'm sure somebody would have snuck in with a Sharpie by now and ruined it. You know what I mean? Or like graffiti. It would have been gone by now. You know it. 7,000 year old paintings. Yeah, protect these for another 17,000 years, please. Number four, Surtsey Island. Another fun island. Another weird story. Here we go. When it comes to new things in life, it's pretty rare that we get a new island, right? Especially on our planet when we're losing things and melting. How lucky are we? Sure. We're even luckier that Disney didn't build a resort here first because now scientists, now they get a chance to study what an island looks like without human interaction. That's a fun little project to focus on in the future. That's cool. It's pretty cool. It's weird and scary, but it's cool, I guess. Yeah, kind of nervous. I don't know. Surtsey Island in Iceland, as of right now, it's only open to a few scientists and geologists. Everybody else? Beat it, go find your own island, get out of here. It was born from a volcanic eruption back in 1963 and scientists, they have one rule on this island, don't talk about Fight Club. And the second rule is no seeds. Yeah, no life, no chance at life at all. Choose something else, anything else, please. One guy accidentally pooped out a tomato seed and he almost ruined the whole operation. The guy almost ruined his entire plan. What a stressful job, it's so eerie to see the oldest human history and then immediately after see a new island where humans are forbidden. It's like, we're not allowed to go and be places anymore. I'm kind of uh, not, that's not great. What are we doing here? I'm just breathing on things, I can't take a sh this island? Number three, Spaceman. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos, some dude's trying to do a moonwalk in between, his face is like melting this way. It's great. You're like, ah, classic Jeff. It's the best. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in a otherwise empty marsh long before Photoshop existed, and yet somehow there appears to be an astronaut in the background, well, that's not very fun, is it? That's a little bit concerning. Jim assures us that nobody was around when this photo was taken, which I, of course, believe, because why would you put your kid in a photo with whatever that is? That's, no, no thank you, it's not a weird, we're not gonna go and talk to that guy. Also, the fact that this man looks like he's from space, that ought to do it, that makes him more weird and believable. What are we looking at right now? I have no idea. Kodak even got involved in the story, like, Kodak. Not Kodak Black, like the company. They got involved. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with. Yeah, and that's Kodak, right? They don't lie about anything. Spider-Man leak, Kodak's like, nah, it's Andrew Garfield. Don't listen to that. So authentic, can't confirm. Number two, nursing home spirit. This photo was taken from a nursing home resident the same night that another resident had passed away, which is an odd thing to do, just set up a camera thing right after. You're like, yeah, just in case, you know, maybe we'll catch one. Well, they did. This was back in 2015, and that night they heard a door open and close, but there were no visitors allowed at the time, so, you know, some, some Kodak was coming into the picture at this point. So now there's a great amount of people who think that this image is one of two things. It's either the spirit of the resident that passed away, or it's the Grim Reaper. Yeah, the door opening and closing, People think that was the Grim Reaper coming in and then leaving, which is so scary. How long was he in there? Was it like 46 seconds, four minutes? How long does this guy operate? Is he quick? Is it like busting tables? Is he just like, all right, let's do this. Is he like Santa Claus? I feel like he's like Santa Claus. A few comments were also saying that it's comforting, this photo, to know that in the end you aren't alone and that you have someone assisting you to the um, afterlife. No, I'm good. I'd rather die alone than have uh, whatever that is break into my home and close and open doors. I'm good. And finally, number one, the Battle of Los Angeles, or lack thereof. We'll see. I don't know. This is a weird one. Of course, we have to end on one of the most unspeakable battles, photos, whatever you want to call it, of all time. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February 1942. Now, this event, first of all, took place 
only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So I'll admit, everyone's a little on edge. We're a little stressed out. We've got some hands hovering over some buttons. We're a little nervous. Sure, something like 25 enemy aircraft was apparently spotted flying over Los Angeles in the late hours of February 24th. So air raids then went off. Blackouts were put in effect. This was not a drill, right? Or was it? What was this? This thing was getting lit up in the sky. Around 1,400 shells were blasted off and two people had a heart attack. That's how loud it was. In total, five people ended up dying from this retaliation and apparently it was a false alarm. Although many now believe that it was UFOs or aliens and that's why we were launching stuff at it. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. People have heart attacks. He's like, oops, I was nervous, my bad, slipped. A little quick reaction there. Number 10, bank robberies. Okay, when we hear about the wild, wild, rootin' tootin', wild west, whatever, we think of outlaws like Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch, the James Younger Gang. Apparently, it was just bank robbery central back then. Just a lot of a lot of this and tapping and riding horses and stuff. That's really not true. Bank robberies didn't happen that often in real life. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies. Eight. That many years ago, along 15 western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. Much more than eight. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by the famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Fun rootin' tootin' history. Number nine, camels. My favorite actor growing up, hands down, was Woody from Toy Story. The guy's physical comedy was on point. And no, I don't mean Tom Hanks. I mean Woody, with this crazy little cowboy run, tipping his hat. But what's a cowboy without his horse, right? As soon as Bullseye got introduced in Toy Story 2, the picture was complete. A cowboy and a horse. We've seen this combo at some point in our lives everywhere. But did you know that for around 100 years, camels were part of Texas wildlife? So imagine a cowboy on a camel. Yeah, that's real. That's That happened. Imagine two cowboys on the humps of a camel. How silly and intimidating would that look? Back in 1855, Congress spent thousands to purchase and ship feral camels from Egypt. The hot southwest would make sense when it comes to camels doing their camel thing. But by 1857, the army had 70 camels. Things were going well until, you know, the Civil War happened, and then the camels escaped and all that madness, and then from then on, for 100 years or so, they bred and roamed Texas. Yeehaw, on a camel, have fun. Number eight, cowboys. All right, since we're talking about cowboys, let's really talk about cowboys. Who were these guys? Was everybody just a cowboy off the bat, or did you have to earn it like a knight? What's the deal here? Well, the guys that we picture in our brain, like Woody, those are cattle herders, and then buffalo, thousands of them, they would roam the land to eat and find water. They would travel miles away, so the herders would follow on horseback and then drive them back to the ranch. They mostly ate beans, dried meat, obviously, and a lot of coffee. Those are the three main ingredients of yeeing and hawing. Am I a cowboy? I love beans and coffee. Coffee beans? Huh, don't even get me started. A classic Western outfit was the denim jeans and chaps, the leather covers that, you know, go over your legs. The large rim hats were called Stetsons. Aside from looking cool, they were large enough to keep the sun out of your eyes. That hat would also double down as a drinking bowl for their horse. Sharing is caring. Number seven, the Bison Express. Humans are responsible for the disappearance on many, many wild animals in one way or another. It's usually our fault. Yeah, going back to the wild, wild west, the year 1869 specifically, that's when the Pacific Railroad was done. It was open to the west to all these explorers, but now they were whipping across these wild lands in record speed, passing hundreds of bison every single trip. Eventually, it didn't take long for these railroads to advertise hunting excursions on these trains. So yeah, guests would climb aboard the top of the train cars and hunt on the top of the trains. Yeah, on the top, they would just shoot these animals for sport. Obviously, the train couldn't stop and go back for the bodies, so they would just leave them. This one man, Orlando Bond, nicknamed the Brick, okay, he apparently shot thousands himself. He rode the express so many times his rifle caused him to go deaf in one ear. This was done purposely to deprive Native Americans of their food supply. Now our bison's number are incredibly low, something like 2% of what it once was, and humans, well, we're still pretty garbage. What do you know? Number six, alcohol. 
These saloons cowboys would visit, was there a bouncer? Did you need two pieces of ID? What was the drinking age back then? Well, besides the swinging saloon doors, it really wasn't a fun time at all. Alcohol back then, first of all, was basically just poison. Actually, it was literally poison sometimes. They had whiskey like 40 rods and Tao's lightning. You have a couple of those and you're literally passing out in minutes. Nobody was getting cut off in old timey saloons. The bartender wasn't like, hey, how about a water buddy? Let's get you home. No, it was a show. They had this one drink on bar rail called tarantula juice. Yeah, happy 21st birthday, go throw up. It was made from strychnine, which was actual poison. So when the whiskey wore off, the strychnine would be left over in the patron's body, and it felt like tarantulas were crawling all over your skin. Ugh, yeah, I'm good with a Bud Light Lime. Thanks, man. Number five, the gold rush. Picture a billboard for the wild, wild west, okay? What's on it right now? A cowboy tipping his hat in the corner with you know four missing teeth, a sunset in the corner, obviously, maybe a horse, and also a bunch of gold stacked up in a mine, right? Well, we've heard about the Wild West here and there, but was there really a massive gold rush? The California Gold Rush of 1849, despite what history commonly believes, wasn't the first big gold rush, not even close. The first one was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock right on his property. He had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, used this rock as a door stopper. You already know where I'm going with this. This 17 pound nugget of gold, which is worth a lot even today, back then this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right after. Then later in 1828, more gold was discovered, but this time in Georgia. This was the second rush. Then come 1848, James Marshall found gold at Sutter's Mill, California. After the third one though, that's when the thousands moved out west. That one had the biggest pull. So. It's pretty big, but not the first. Number four, the OK Corral. The shootout at the OK Corral went down on October 26th, 1881. It's known as the most famous shootout in history. But should it be, really? Going back to Tombstone, Arizona, it's 3 p.m. and we have men of the law and of course, outlaws, all in the same block. So naturally, trouble ensues. There's not enough land here for all of us, some rootin' tootin' shit. There were about eight men involved in the rumble, but it barely lasted 30 seconds. Also, it's important to note the gunfight at the OK Corral wasn't even at the OK Corral. It happened near the intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street, right behind the corral. Yeah, details matter. Three lawmen were injured and three cowboys lost their lives. Yeehaw. That was a sad yeehaw for you guys. This is why you don't organize shootouts at 3 p.m. I don't know, everyone's drunk, there's bad decisions, apparently there's bad aim. Just slam some milk, shake some hands, go home. Simple. Number three, Helena Duels. So we talked about the bizarre ways folks would settle beef back then. They would slam tarantula juice and shoot animals from the top of locomotives, have a 30 second fist fight in the middle of the day and then go home. But have you heard of these Helena Duels? It began of course in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth, at least it was back in the 1800s. The Helena Duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They show this style of combat in a pretty brutal, Hollywood way. Both opponents had their left hands tied together with buckskin, and then each were given a small knife with an even smaller blade. It had to be short enough so it didn't reach any vital organ. That was the Texas trick. Then they're whirled around until they're dizzy, and then it gets really loud, really messy, and really bloody. Last man standing, pretty much. The crowd, of course, watches and places bets, which is always insane to me. I can't watch UFC sometimes. I don't like seeing things break, let alone a Helena duel. Catch me inside sipping milk, texting my ex. Hard pass, freaks. Number two, train games. Entertainment was always a hit or miss when it comes to these historical lists. The Romans held gladiator battles with animals that drew in thousands of spectators from across the land. Well, in 1894, William Crush, a railway man, had this event in mind that would for sure go down in history. Oh buddy, did it ever. William Crush wanted to secure the future of the railroad company in Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. And to do so, William made an entire temporary city appropriately named the city of Crush. Nice. There was a carnival for children to enjoy and all that jazz, but the main pull for adults was the train smash. The collision of two 40 ton steam trains was meant to be the talk of the town. Look at these goliaths as they smash, or I mean crush, haha, <laughs> into each other. How fun. Yeah, the trains collided, it worked, and the darnest thing happened, um, they blew up. Yeah, it's almost like they caused a disaster for popularity, neat. 
40,000 came in and many left injured. A couple of people sadly didn't leave at all. One survivor ended up getting 10 grand out of the deal. His name was JC Dean and they lost their eye in the explosion. So the company gave them a lifetime railway pass. Just the thing you want right after that horrific event. Sorry about your eye. Here's free PTSD as well. Anytime you want. Enjoy. Crush was later rehired by the railway after it gained popularity. Yeah, this shit happened back then too. Somebody does something horrible and then now all of a sudden they're famous. Hashtag chair girl. And finally coming in at number one, Elmer McCurdy. This one is insane. I had to end with it. Elmer McCurdy back in 1911, he decided to be a rootin' tootin' criminal and he attempted to rob a train. Unbeknownst to him, that train was not full of gold, but rather passengers. Collecting a whopping $46, which back then was still pretty good, he was quickly shot by a lawman afterwards. This is where things start to get insane. Yeah, I say start. Elmer's body was embalmed and sold by The Undertaker to this traveling carnival. His body was an exhibit almost, with his story attached. And for the next 60 years, his body, this prop rather, was passed around, sold between haunted houses and wax museums. Eventually, the guy's body, his real body, don't forget, ends up in California at an amusement park funhouse at Long Beach. Now, come 1976, there's a crew there filming for the $6 million man show, and that's when Elmer's finger breaks off accidentally. Some key grips like, whoops, revealing it was an actual mummy. They went to film the $6 million man and ended up finding the $46 man in real life. How gross is that? Number 10, demonic boy photo. All right, scary as hell right off the hop. It doesn't matter where or when, but odds are you've seen this photo at some point in your life. It's pretty haunting. It's kind of hard to forget. Check it out. You know when you see a photo, sometimes you just get bad vibes, like it registers in your brain as something real and scary. You want to find something about this photo that looks fake, but it's hard. This photo here was taken inside the Amityville house back in 1976, the real house. It appears to be a young boy with glowing white eyes. Kind of, kind of hard to forget. It was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared, so nobody actually took this themselves, it was just set up. It makes it even creepier that the boy looks like he's peeking around the corner. Makes my heart race just looking at that photo right there. A photographer named Gene Campbell operated this and got this photo. See, Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren at this time, the famous duo, now rocking the big screen Conjuring Universe. They were on this case in real life. This photo was then revealed three years later on the Merv Griffin Show. Imagine tuning in, watching TV on the Merv Griffin Show, and then all of a sudden you see the ghost of John DeFeo. That's nice. Yeah, many believe this is the ghost of one John DeFeo, one of the boys who lived there prior to that 1974 horrible event. We're still trying to cover this. What do you guys think? Elaborate hopes or perhaps this photo is one solid piece of evidence that the Amityville house was and still is indeed haunted. Number nine, Svalbard Vault. Over the pandemic, I spent a lot of time playing video games. Chris and I actually just talked about video games for like eight minutes straight before we click record, so that's pretty funny. Some of my favorite games always have a similar theme. They always have this post-apocalyptic feel. It's always just barren wasteland with like one dog as a survivor and you have to like go and eat scraps. Yeah, follow it. It's a great game. There's shelters with survivors or even vaults. It's stressful, but it's engaging, right? Searching around. Now in real life, we do have a global seed vault and it's deep in the Arctic Circle on the island Spitsbergen. Now in this massive bunker that has since been deemed the Doomsday Vault, great name, really rolls off the tongue there. This is where humans will store food crops. It contains 100 million seeds. So if the earth all of a sudden, you know, gets wiped out, or even if all the ice melts and it floods and everything goes to quickly, this vault will still be good to go. All that water that just, you know, flooded the rest of humanity will then regrow the earth with all of these seeds, ideally. It sounds like a fun, cute way to get humans to think about the future. You're like, hey, throw some seeds in, make a wish. But I'm concerned. Is there something we don't know? How soon is this gonna happen? Why is everybody involved in this little seed heist? Number eight, Pluto's Gate. Number eight, Pluto's Gate. It rhymes, what's up? Also known as the Gate to Hell. Hey, that's horrifying. These runes discovered in Turkey back in 1965 are beautiful, but they're also cursed. Historians believe that the site is the ancient city of Hierapolis. And if you're thinking about visiting these eerie ruins, well, you better leave the family pet at home. Yet yeah, any and all animal that enters these ruins, they also meet instant death. Sparrows were tossed in and then they immediately stopped breathing and they dropped. This was horrifying vocals, so they had to resort to science. Scientists have figured out the solution and it's still pretty haunting. They measured the CO2 
concentration and it turns out while the sun is up, it burns away the gas. But at night, when the temperature drops significantly, the CO2 becomes heavier than that of air. Then it creates this deadly gas cloud on the floor. And then when the sun rises back up again, the concentration of CO2 hits 35%. So it's deadly enough for animals and sometimes even humans. Yeah, just stay away from anything called the gates of hell. How about that? It's pretty sound advice just to play it safe. Number seven, The Lady of Raynham Hall. This one's a classic. If my grandma was still alive, she would have loved this one. If you haven't seen this photo, it's gonna live rent free in your head from here on out. This spirit is said to haunt Raynham Hall in Norfolk, England. Nice. My old home. Not Norfolk, but I have English family. What's up? This tale kicked off back in 1936 after a photo went around through Country Life magazine. I guess that's its way of going viral back then, right? This photo shows a spirit, apparently, wearing a brown gown. Hence where her name comes from, the Brown Lady of Raynham Hall. Just casually floating down a staircase. That's lovely. Imagine seeing this in real life. I'm sweating doing this list. Legend has it that the ghost is that of Dorothy Townshend. She was the sister of Robert Walpole, the first Prime Minister of Britain back in 1676. Some reports say the image is a result of long exposure, just gone awry, but you know, either way, I don't like looking at this photo. So let's move on. Great. Number six, the gates of Guinea. Another bad portal to another bad place. The souls of the dead have to go somewhere. And depending on your beliefs, that somewhere could either be beautiful, it could be peaceful, or it could be uh, absolutely terrifying. Who knows, one of the three. In the world of voodoo, that place is an underworld called the Gates of Guinea. And here is the front door. Yeah, located in Louisiana, this tomb, that of voodoo priestess Marie Lavio, is apparently the entrance to these deep waters, this twilight realm. And some voodoo followers try and open these gates to access the souls of the deep. And apparently the goal after that point would be to use the dead almost like zombies, like your own little personal zombie army. So that's horrible, I guess. Number five, backseat driver. This photo here is from 1959 and it certainly looks like it. It was taken by a lady named Mabel Chinnery and the photo at first glance is just a classic 60s shot of a man in a car. That man was Mabel's husband. Now the man in the back seat however we have no idea who that is. Apparently they weren't there in real life. Her husband was the only one in the car at that time. And also, that's a pretty tough angle. If you wanted to recreate this photo with your friends after work, it would be hard. You have to really line something up there. Some Edgar Wright shot has to happen. You know what I mean? It's like he's appearing to us through the seat almost. So either this is a lie, and there was indeed a man sitting in the back left seat, or like Mabel believes, this is her dead mother-in-law. Now, if she had said father-in-law, I'd think maybe it's a spirit, but this for sure looks like an older man with a collar. So we don't know. A lot of ghosts just like to hang around. Honestly, Mabel, just see a priest, just to be safe. Number four, ghost pilot. Oh, this one gives me the absolute creeps. I'm hoping it's just a friendly ghost, but really, you never know. I never know. I don't know. I don't want anything to do with any ghost, but sometimes they're friendly, apparently. Any sort of spirit, I don't welcome. There, I said it. The ghost pilot is a photograph that shows a spirit from 1987, when a woman named Mrs. Sayer was visiting an airfield in England. So of course she did the tourist thing and she got a photo in the cockpit, as we all do. Especially now, after seeing Top Gun, I'd be like, yo, get a photo of me. But while you're sitting in there getting that tourist photo, do you ever think of who may have sat there before? It's kind of creepy, right? People swear the Titanic was a cursed ship and that spirits were responsible for the ship's bad luck. I personally believe it was the iceberg, but you know, I'm open. Next time you want to sit in the pilot seat, look around for spirits. This image was developed and it appears somebody or something is in the helicopter with Mrs. Sayer. Yeah, nothing like finding out after, eh? Oh. Number three. The Specter of Newby Church. This one comes from 1963, so it's a little more recent, but even so, this is one of the most convincing on this list, in my humble opinion. Reverend K.F. Lord took this photo in the Newby Church in England. England's a hot spot for ghosts, eh? Damn. And Lord ensures us that this photo is 100% real. I mean, to be fair, it looks like the spirit is facing the camera, so I don't know. It's a great frame, but I'm still believing. The whole Plague Doctor vibe going on here, that's what makes me feel gross here. Anything with Plague Doctors is always giving me the creeps, so I can't even look at this photo. The figure seems to be standing on the first step to the altar, yet somehow it is still taller than the actual altar itself. We think this being, this ghost, is about nine feet tall, so so whoever faked this, if that is the case, they must have been on stilts or something. Also, stilts and a sheet over your face on a staircase? I don't know. That's, I don't think anyone faked this. That's for sure a very tall demon. Drink your milk, then you'll be tall and strong in the afterlife, just like that demon right there. Number two, the Paris Catacombs. As above, so below, 
is an underrated horror film. It's very good. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Makes you all sweaty and not nice. In the movie, a team of explorers accidentally go too deep when exploring the Paris catacombs, and in turn, they have to face their own hellish nightmare. I'm not gonna give anything away. Well, this is not too far-fetched, it seems. In what feels like a never-ending maze, the tunnels underneath Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. See, originally, the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, it turned into something a little more haunting. Cemeteries at this point in history were starting to fill up, and I mean that in a literal sense, like bodies. It was gross, we didn't know what to do, right? Humans didn't figure out the cleanliness thing for a while, so bodies would be laying on the side of the road. So the solution here was to use these catacombs, right? These tunnels have been there for centuries, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean arguably the scariest basement in the world. Just walls of skulls. What could possibly go wrong? So haunted. Never go in there, so haunted. Do you live in Paris? Have you seen this? Has anyone actually been down there? I wanna hear your account. Comment down below, because that's a scary movie, man. That's really not great. And finally, number one, Chernobyl. One of the greatest nuclear disasters ever in history. On April 26, 1986, reactor number four at the Chernobyl power complex exploded due to unstable and low power levels. Reactor four had been shut down a day before due to maintenance, and the next day at 1.23 a.m., radioactive debris compiled the fuel and reactor components just rained down all over the building. It's a nightmare scenario. Toxic fumes were carried from the wind and after just four months, 28 workers had died due to radiation exposure. Eventually, they had to evacuate over 100,000 residents, and to this day, that zone is a no-go. Reactor 4 will stay highly radioactive for another 20, thousand years, so no time soon. Let's not head back there anytime soon. Kicking off our list at number 10, floating hand. Okay, this one is so scary. Kill those lights. Let's dive into it, right? This photo is from over a hundred years ago. Now this time, the photographer may or may not have caught a floating spirit hand in their photo. Yeah, I'll show you the photo. Let me know if you see it at first, right? Take a glance. What's wrong with this photo? Anything sticking out? Any floating hands? Just, uh, appearing in the photo. This photo is a group of women who worked in a linen factory. The lady on the far right appears to have an extra hand resting on her shoulder. Yeah, her right, our left. This may be a hidden person, maybe somebody with long arms was out of frame. I'm a lanky guy myself. I can put my arms around like nine of my friends in a photo, I get it. But it's the positioning of the hand that gives me the chills, right? It looks curled almost, which gives it a demonic, insidious, the last key vibes. You know what I'm saying? Number nine. Colossal squid. Not to be confused with the giant squid, those are similar, but dare I say, smaller. Mm -hmm. As its name hint towards, the colossal squid is it's huge. It's one of the biggest things I've ever seen in my entire life. They live in the darkest, coldest depths surrounding the waters of Antarctica. These squid are on average 46 feet in length, with the females being the largest of the species. They have large tentacles with suckers equipped with razor hooks, so whatever it grabs, it's certainly not letting go anytime soon. Its diet consists of large fish, and when I say large, I'm referring to a seven foot long Pentagonian toothfish. You know, not like a little goldfish. No, these are colossal. They need a colossal meal. They try and fight whales sometimes. You know what I mean? They have no regard for the size of others, and they're more often than not marked up, suggesting that they've been in a few deep sea tussles, right? Octopus wants to fight. It's my favorite IPA. That's the inspiration right there. On top of being magnificent, they're quite mysterious. Only two specimens have ever been collected, with the second being as recent as 2014. Do you believe this is the closest living thing to the Kraken? I don't know, I'm horrified of deep sea creatures, so this list is haunting in my way, okay? Number eight, Island of the Dolls, Mexico. I'm also not a fan of dolls on islands, so pretty haunting. This island is famous, of course, for having dolls or doll parts just spread about all over. Why, you ask? Well, let's talk about it. The islands surrounding this one are inhabited, but this one is said to be filled with demonic spirits, so no one's hanging out, no one's camping, I guess. Specifically, the spirit of a young girl who drowned there way back like Camp Crystal Lake, only creepier, dare I say. These dolls are hanging or nailed to the trees. Now the dolls have to come from somewhere, right? And they came from a local resident by the name of Julian Santa Barrera. He put all these doll parts up in order to try and ward away any demonic spirits, right? He's fighting back by nailing doll parts to a tree, I guess. that's He's a hero. To this day, nobody dares to approach the island. They would much rather snap a photo from far away on their boat, which I totally agree with. That's probably a much better idea. If it didn't look haunted before, it definitely does now with the doll parts. I don't know. Great call, Julian. Could have used smudge sticks though? I don't know. Doll parts, that's a bit haunting. Number seven, nursing home spirit. Also, we're gonna throw in some ghosts in this list. So again, hope those lights are 
dimmed. This photo was taken from a nursing home resident the same night another resident had passed away and they had no idea. This was back in 2015. That night, they heard a door open and close out in the hallway, but no visitors were allowed there at the time. So they noted it. it was, you know, a little odd. So there's a great amount of people who thinks that this image here is one of two things. One, the spirit of the resident that sadly passed away, or two, it could be the Grim Reaper. Yeah, how scary is that? Both terrible options. A few comments were saying how it's comforting to know that in the end, you aren't alone and you know, an entity or something will walk you to the other side. I disagree. I think it's uh, terrifying. I'd rather die alone than have this dude break into my home and then walk me to the afterlife. I don't want any Grim Reaper. Thank you. Check out this photo. What do you think? Is this real or is this fake? Comment down below. Number six, magnificent alien. While the rest of the world was in panic mode, a new sea sponge was discovered in 2020. How fun is that? And by fun, I mean definitely an alien. This is terrifying. It was named Advina Magnifica, which translates to magnificent alien. Alien, yep, magnificent alien, they're gonna call it. This sponge literally gets its name because it looks like E.T. And to be fair, it does look like E.T., it's kinda cute. An ROV found this sample over 6,000 feet deep in the Pacific Ocean. This was never meant to be found, and we did it. They found it in what they call a forest of weird. Just an alien sponge sticking their E.T. heads out, hoping for some food to pass by. That's literally their entire life. They just sit there and wait in the darkness until some sort of dust just sticks on them, and they go, and they eat it, somehow. Christiana Castella Branco, the researcher who found this deep sea squishy, explains the discovery in an NOAA interview saying, as all these organisms are intricately connected by documenting and describing marine biodiversity, we are building a better understanding of life and the impact of humans on Earth, and in this case, in the ocean, end quote. For a guy like me who doesn't like the ocean or any of the creatures in it. That's terrifying. See ya. Number five. The Shining Hotel Spirit. The Stanley Hotel in Colorado is now, of course, quite famous for its use in the Stanley Kubrick 1980 classic, The Shining. The lodge, being over 100 years old, has a pretty decent chance of being haunted in real life. So the spirit tours that happen there pack a punch for fans of the production and also fans for the paranormal. Jay Mosling was on one of these tours, so like any ghost expert would do, they snapped a few photos of random corners of the room. Gotta catch those ghosts with the flash, it's the only way. After the trip, he was going through said photos and he found this gem. It appears to be a spirit, a demon, a ghost, an apparition, something. Something that's see-through and floating, so scary. It also has long black hair, it appears, so yeah, I don't know what's going on there. The room was of course empty at the time the photo was taken, and I do believe that. There's no way you could just snap random photos of people and be like, oh, I was looking for ghosts, sorry. <laughs> no, that's illegal, you can't do that. Number four. Deep sea pigs. All right, we'll bring it back up to some scary sea stuff. These guys are a genus of sea cucumber, but they have these little tube-like legs, which is why they look super weird and scary. Not that regular sea cucumbers look exceptionally normal, but these ones look even weirder than that of regular ones, so gotta include them. They like to live on the seafloor, where they move through the sediment, searching for their next meal. They eat, check this out, they eat by extracting tiny little particles of organic matter that's just fallen from the surface of the ocean. Yeah, they just wait around for scraps to, again, just land on them. How sad is that? It's kind of funny, but it's mostly sad. Sea pigs measure out to be four to six inches long. So yeah, I guess they're cute, sure, I guess. They're small, so therefore cute. I'll admit it, they're okay to look at. And they live at a depth of somewhere between 1,200 to 5,000 meters deep, so I don't have to worry about any of these sea pigs grabbing my own little piggies, right? They're quite deep, so therefore out of sight, out of mind. They are small, but they're mighty. Their skin carries a natural poison, which can make them a horrible midnight snack for anyone involved. Also, when brought up closer to the surface, they literally disintegrate. So that's a scary fact to know about an animal. Number three, underneath Thwaites Glacier. We've seen some fascinating stuff here on Bumblebee, specifically underwater creatures and haunting stuff from our past. We love exploring the depths, and this next one, I couldn't believe. It's actually terrifying to look at. This is footage from the bottom of an Antarctic glacier. This glacier is the size of Florida. If it collapses, our sea levels could rise 10 feet, so it's a pretty big deal. So scientists were like, yeah, let's drill a hole through the middle of it and see what happens. Yeah, in 2019, researchers drilled 2,300 feet right through the middle of the Thwaites Glacier, and they dropped a robot with the camera down, and they saw this. This is the first time we've seen the grounding zone of Thwaites Glacier. Lead scientist Brittany Schmidt says this project is a dream come true, and for me, it's a nightmare that I now have to look at. I don't want to watch this video ever again, but you should. It's pretty cool. Number two. 
Tomb KB55. Classic, going back to Egypt for our Bumblebee fans. Located in the Valley of Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise KB55, was discovered by Edward Arton back in 1907. And the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because, well, we don't know who or what exactly was inside. Even the walls inside of it, they aren't like other tombs, covered in ancient hieroglyphs or, you know, art or anything nice. No, this time there's nothing here. The only hint that remains is one hieroglyph. And it's scary, it translates to, the evil one shall not live again. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out of the tomb. Yeah, out of the tomb. Usually with ancient tombs in history, it's the opposite. Things are, you know, prevented to get grave robbers to come in. This time they're like, no, 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 we don't want anything getting out. That's kind of haunting. Many believe that it's Akhenaten because he got on the wrong foot with uh, you know, the high priests over 17 years of ruling. He was convincing everybody that their art and religion was wrong. And the only God in existence was his sun God. So his own son, King Tut, succeeded him and luckily restored the previous religion back to normal. But yeah, maybe that's why this tomb is empty. Maybe they're like, you know what? We don't want history to remember you. You tried to out religion, so we're good. Number one, house guest. I saved the best for last, and by that I mean this is the scariest thing I've ever seen. This video, yep, yeah, little surprise for you, there we go. This comes from a middle-aged man in Oxford, North Carolina. It was his day off of work and he was looking forward to just kicking back, relaxing, and instead he had to deal with this. Instead, the lights in his home started to flicker, and immediately after, the smoke detector started to go off. The lights were flickering all over the house, not just one room. The fridge light, the bathroom light, you name it, the water even started to run by itself. So something started to go wrong, apparently. And he filmed the happenings, but when he looked back in the footage, you know, after fleeing his home on his only day off, he caught this peeking from the other room when looking back. Pretty terrifying, right? Yeah. To start us off, it doesn't matter if I'm dead or alive, you should invite me. Number 10 is Skeletal Dinner Guest. For my people who hate to feel discluded, you'd probably love the members of the Postmortem Club. All members were present when they held their annual breakfast meeting, including club president J.M. McAdoo, who had died the previous year. You'll see in the photo presiding president Oakley Smith, club members, and the skeleton of Mr. McAdoo gathered together for breakfast with the skeleton at the head of the table. One of the rules of the club is that each member will will his or her skeleton to it for attendance to the club despite death. They even gave him a cigarette as you can see because smoking can't kill you if you're a skeleton. Number 9 is human depravity at its finest, the Stanford Prison Experiment. University professor Philip Zimbardo's execution of a power imbalance study in a prison ended disastrously. The Stanford Prison Experiment commenced on August 14th of 1971 with student volunteer groups comprising of 11 guards and 10 prisoners to see how they would behave on their own inside of a fabricated prison. The goal is to assess how quickly and intensely even educated or normal people can turn into cruel or sadistic ones under the right conditions. And man, was it fast. Six days in, Philip had to call off the experiment as guards were increasingly abusive to the inmates, spraying them with fire extinguishers, forcing them to clean toilets barehanded, denying them food, or just simply beating on them. The inmates and few guards who were visible minorities faced the worst treatment out of everyone. The study and the eerie photos of it inside left behind a chilling look at what humans are capable of. A killer's plea is number eight. All right, so obviously someone who takes other people's lives shouldn't get to plea anything, but in the case of the 1946 lipstick killer, their plea wasn't one for freedom or for mercy. At a Chicago crime scene, the perpetrator used lipstick to write on the wall, quote, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill, I cannot control myself. This message may actually sound kind of familiar. It's because TV shows including Criminal Minds, Castle, Law and Order, and so many more have actually taken inspiration from this image and its written message for varying episodes. The man who had written this message, William Hirons, gets his wish as he's caught soon after. He was convicted and at the time of Hirons' death in 2012, he'd been locked up for approximately 66 years, making him the longest serving inmate in the USA. William's message is a reminder that not all those who commit heinous crimes are in their right of mind and sometimes they have no ability to control their actions. While it's not an excuse, it is an explanation. Number seven is the sacrifice of Michael Rockefeller. Michael Rockefeller was the son of New York governor and soon to be US Vice President Nelson Rockefeller and he famously disappeared in Papua New Guinea in 1960s. This photo is of his first trip there. Rockefeller can be seen centered and smiling as indigenous people circle and run around him. Michael's known for his travels. He loved to visit the unexplored and untouched areas of society and learn about cultures many considered primitive. He saw the art and beauty in them. This desire for adventure took Rockefeller to the remote reaches of Papua New Guinea in 1961 
one. They arrived near the island of Dutch on November 19th, and even though they were 12 miles from shore, Rockefeller reportedly told anthropologist Renee Wassing, I think I can make it, and jumped into the water and headed for land and was never seen again. It's believed at first that he drowned, but Rockefeller had done a swim like that to shore actually multiple times. Because he was a member of a super rich American dynasty, there was a massive search. Ships, airplanes, helicopters, everything combed the region for any sign of him. They found nothing. National Geographic reporter Carl Hoffman offered a far more disturbing thesis than drowning in his 2014 book, Savage Harvest. The island Rockefeller swam to was inhabited by the Azmuth, an uncontacted and primarily unfriendly indigenous clan. Hoffman claims to have uncovered evidence showing that Rockefeller made it to land where he was then decapitated by the Azmat people before they ceremonially him, eating his brain and using his bones likely to make weaponry and other items. The confusing unanswered end of Rockefeller air has since been debated, but it will always remain unsolved sadly. Number 6 is we're leaving on a UFO. Not as catchy as a jet plane, but Marshall Applewhite was told by aliens it was a UFO indefinitely. So Marshall had been told a lot of things by the aliens, as had his wife before her passing. Affectionately self dubbed as T and Doe after the musical scales, they believed themselves to be of the highest caliber, like T and Doe are on the scale. The cult these two began, Heaven's Gate, is famously recognized for the tragic mass departure members took on March 26 of 1997. It's on that day that the 39 members of the cult were convinced to consume a mixture of barbiturates and applesauce and then washed it down with vodka. As one member walked around to each poisoned person and tied bags over their heads to ensure asphyxiation. This mass taking of life was discovered days later when panicked family members of cult members hadn't heard from them. One former member went to go find his beloved wife and well I'm sure you can imagine what he found. What was confusing for many was to find the group covered in purple shrouds with their feet sticking out. They wore Nike sneakers with the classic white swoop. They believed these wings were going to carry them to the heavens. Countless photos were taken by FBI and police, most of which have been leaked to public by now and depict this very scene that I'm describing. Confusing and devastating, this loss was in international news and a reminder to always be aware of your own susceptibility to influence. Number 5 is the frozen man of Mount Everest. And yeah, yeah, I get it. We all know that there's tons of frozen bodies along Mount Everest, but that's not what I'm actually talking about this time. The photo you'll see is of mountain climber Beck Weathers, who in May of 1996 attempted to complete the final leg of the ascent on Everest. Despite how short the distance was, the journey caught up to Beck, and he came down with a case of snow blindness during an intense blizzard that had a wind chill of 100 degrees below zero, and he fell into a hypothermic coma. Initially, I thought I was in a dream, Weathers later recalled. Then I saw how badly frozen my right hand was, and that helped bring me around to reality. Beck was left for dead, first by his exhibition and then the second time by a rescue crew doctor who believed him beyond saving. So it's only by miracle that Beck manages to break a hypothermic coma, turn around and walk back to base camp. When he reaches camp, Beck is airlifted immediately as frostbite set in on his nose and hands, both of which are later amputated. This moment is caught in photograph and shows the frozen hand and Beck visibly unconscious being carried in a red sleeping bag. This ascent to Everest is remembered as the 1996 Mount Everest. Everest disaster and is famously covered in John Krakauer's book Thin Air and its 1997 adaption as well as films Everest and Everest 2015. So by the way, they prematurely told Beck's wife and family he had passed away. Can you imagine that emotional roller coaster? Number 4 is the Maori Trophy Heads. The native Maori of New Zealand had a cultural practice of preserving severed heads of enemies for trophy and warning purposes. They are called mokomokai and these heads were processed by first of course getting chopped off but then boiled smoked and sun dried. The Maori would then coat them in shark oil to prevent cracking and peeling before mounting them. When British colonizers invaded the land during the 1840s, the Maori heads were one of the famously pillaged artifacts and treasures of the colonial era. Major General Horatio Gordon Robley was in service for the British army when they were invading and pillaging New Zealand in the 1960s. He was particularly enthralled by the Maori heads and the absolute piece of you know what actually stole 35 of them for his own collection. You can see him in this photo sitting at the base of a wall with Maori heads mounted upon it. Naturally, like most of what was stolen by British colonialists for the crown and or for themselves, these items were never returned to their rightful peoples and instead earned profit in British museums or collect dust in storerooms. Since the 1970s, New Zealand has had a strong record of requesting those remains back from overseas. The first major international reparation of a toy moko happened in 1985, and in 2003, New Zealand created its first government funded international reparations program. It's now seen the return of 800 Maori and Moriori remains. Number 3 is the Rur Cannibal Demonstration, an image caught by police officers as the Rur
himself. Joaquin Kroll reenacts one of the crimes after his capture. Kroll was very particular about how he killed and only doing so in the same place on a few occasions and years apart. This and the fact of the number of other killers operating in the area at the time, it helped him evade capture. This killer started in 1955 and didn't stop for two decades until his capture. He's known to have taken 14 lives without any rhyme or reason, no preference for age, gender, race, status, everyone was on the table. Pun intended, unfortunately. As Kroll wasn't just necrophilic with the bodies, he ate them too. After taking their lives and using their bodies, he would bring home pieces to cook. He was finally caught in 1976 after police discovered intestines from one of his victims clogging the plumbing of the apartment building. Police reported that when a neighbor had asked Kroll about them and if he had knew what had backed up the pipes earlier, Kroll simply replied, guts. Why the police felt the need to reenact his crime photos, I'm not sure, but the result is several photos of Kroll propped over a volunteer in the park looking full of and primal delight that will send a shiver down your spine. Number two is the tragic death of cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov. So imagine knowing you're going to die but still walking aboard. That is what the Soviet astronaut Vladimir did on April 23rd, 1967. The craft had shown countless issues and flaws during testing to an extent where it wasn't even just Vladimir who knew this was going to happen. It was everyone working the project. So why did it go forward despite clear danger? No one was willing to back out and risk the fury or disappointment of the Soviet high command. So Vladimir could have backed out himself, but it would have doomed the next astronaut to be put on the project, who happened to be his close friend, Yuri Gargan. So he was assigned to the mission, and he decided he would do it and spare anyone else. Upon re-entry to Earth, the tragedy happens. The craft's parachute fails, and the Soyuz craft hurtled to Earth at unthinkable speeds, burning Vladimir alive inside. Photos of the craft were taken after its impact, showing a horrific scene of melted plastics, metal, and char. He became the first human to to ever die in space flight and Vladimir himself was so confident this would be the case that he asked for an open casket funeral that had forced his superiors to see what they'd done to him. And so the second famous photo of this incident is taken, Vladimir's superiors standing over the mangled bunch of melted and charred human bones with nauseated horror in their gaze. And so in at number one is what's considered the creepiest photo ever taken by the internet, Broken Blanche Monnier. This is a real life horror story. Blanche is born in 1849 and starts life living lavishly and beloved in her prominent French family home, ingrained with ideas of Prince Charming and happily ever afters. She remains unmarried into her 20s, however, and searches desperately for her true love so she may move away from her domineering mother. It's in 1874 that her wish is granted, and she meets an older man of status and intends to marry him. But Mama disagrees, and she's not feeling he's suitable and she needs someone else. Blanche is furious. He can support her. He's high class, a lawyer. That's everything her mother demanded she finds, and she finally found it. Blanche finally put her foot down against her mother, and her mother makes her regret it for decades to come. Blanche is locked away in the attic closet. There are no windows and only a hay mattress. Once a day, her mother would cram dinner scraps under the doorway for her to eat. Blanche's mother reminds her every day that if she gives up on her betrothed, she would free Blanche. Blanche refuses every time, even after her fiance, unbeknownst to her, passes away in 1885 while she's still imprisoned. It wouldn't have mattered, however. The public had been told by her mother that Blanche had been dead since she locked her away in 1874, so everyone just thought that was the case. Blanche Blanche, meanwhile, survived 16 years in this closet until an anonymous note to police by a maid forces authorities to search the home. They find Blanche, now middle-aged, malnourished, covered in sores and fecal matter, surrounded by vermin and rot. This moment is caught on film by police. You'll see Blanche sitting on her bed, an excited yet lost expression on her face. Her mother and brother were both charged and her mother very quickly and deservedly dies in prison while her brother manages to appeal and escape justice. Blanche is left a shell of a person from 16 years of solitary and dark confinement. She spent the rest of her life in a psychiatric care at one of the state's best hospitals, the sole heir to her mother's precious fortune and status. First up is captured in a card. Alrighty, so you see this basketball card here. So centered, we've got Mark Jackson back in 89 playing a Knicks game. But over here in the far left background, we have familiar faces of Lyle and Eric Mendez. In 1990, the Mark Jackson NBA hoops card went into circulation, a year after the two Mendez brothers depicted in the background killed their parents for life insurance in August of 1989. The brothers claimed a massive payout that allowed them to live a luxurious lifestyle, spending money on expensive watches, clothes, and cars. Among the items that they bought were tickets to a basketball game at Madison Square Garden, where they would eventually be immortalized on an NBA card. To make it a little creepier, logistically, this moment captured would have been between when they killed their parents and when they were arrested. Speaking of sports, there's such a thing as the wrong time to cheer, which is our next photo. See, this is Mike Hawthorne, and 
Ivor Boeb celebrating with champagne after winning the 24H Le Mans. Look at the revelry and the glory between these men. Those around them have a completely different vibe, however. We've got an arrangement of meme expressions going on here. Homeboy in the back holding the book is giving a hell of a judgmental side eye, and we have a signature auntie are you serious expression going on. See, while these men are ecstatically celebrating their win, what isn't captured in this photo was that the raceway was covered in ambulances and fire trucks. Hawthorne had driven an opponent off the track and the resulting accident killed 84 people, most of which were spectators. Videos of this event on YouTube are kinda insane to watch, not even because of the crash or the arrogance of the winners, but the announcer is so painfully cheery it's out of place, using an old timely projection system to shout, oh women and children are dying, whole families are wiped out, but most of the finishing cars were British, a fine achievement in this abhorrent tragedy. It feels like a fever dream. Mountain climb to heaven is next, because if you climb Mount Everest, let's be realistic, all you're doing is making your inevitable trip to heaven a little shorter of a distance upwards, giving yourself and the creator a little shortcut, you know? Alright, so this photo has the same visual quality as some loosely scattered cat litter, but I'm sure you can make out that we've got these silly little tents here, man look how far tents have come, as well as these two dudes and what it looks like high socks. This is the 1924 British Mount Everest expedition. We've talked about a few Mount Everest climber groups and things that have happened to them in a few of our videos, so you may be familiar with this one from our channel. That or literally any Mount Everest movie, they tend to either pick one specific story to document or mismatch all of them together for one plot and then throw Jake Gyllenhaal up on a mountain. Anyways, this photo was taken of George Mallory and Sandy Irvin shortly after they made their ill-fated attempt to get to the summit. While Mallory's body is found literally decades later in 1999, the body of Irvin never has been. Our next photo is of an undeserving celebrity. Why? Because the reason he's a celebrity is so extremely twisted that it blows me away, and I don't mean an undeserving in a Kim Kardashian made a family of talentless people famous through adult video kind of way, I mean in a seriously sick, twisted, criminal, undeserving way. I'll only be calling this man IS, as I do not believe any more infamy should be granted. The photo you see was from a Japanese magazine after he was released from prison due to insanity. IS killed Dutch born Rene Harveld, and the two were studying in Saborn, Paris. He chose to do this because of her health and her beauty characteristics that he felt he lacked. IS considered himself weak, ugly, and small, and claimed he wanted to absorb her energy through, well, he had her body for three days. I'll simply let you piece together what I mean when I say that he had a considerable amount of this body missing and a very interesting fridge contents. But like I said, he was released, so how can you kill someone whilst on a student visa, desecrate remains, and then also do some pretty horrific acts posthumously? He is from a very wealthy Japanese family and they somehow managed to get him released. Also, they paid the victim's parents a huge sum of money for the loss. That's the world we live in. After his release, he was frequently on talk shows, reviewed restaurants for magazines, and appeared in horror films. He even wrote a book on the murder of Renee. This next photo shows us you never know what could be just a reach away. This photo looks relatively normal. Now, obviously, it's not gonna be. It's on this list, and the fact that it's titled about reaching out to something, well, Sarah Funk, who you see here on the waterline, is a YouTube vlogger who's on a trip to Cyprus's Red Lake. And you can see her literally like two feet away away from a suitcase lodged in the waterbed. It's two years after this photo is taken in 2019 that the drifting suitcase is retrieved and opened to reveal the corpse of a girl. She is one of seven known victims of serial killer Nikos Mexata, whose signature was doing body dumps in suitcases. It's believed the reason this case was retrieved in the first place was due to previous sightings of it in the water once other victims of Nikos had started to be found and identified at the same time period. Sarah Funk has since commented on what it's like to know that she was so close to a body without being aware. I thought it was a log at the time, but in retrospect, I realized it wasn't. This is a completely fair explanation, as you can see from that picture, the case was incredibly dirty and hard to identify even as a briefcase. This man is the first recorded serial killer on the island of Cyprus and is currently serving seven life sentences in central prison. Our next photo is recreating time, pun is intended. The photo you see on screen is very peculiar, but not the most outlandish. It's a man standing shirtless behind the fence in a summer afternoon, looking like something out of an old country country family album of sorts. His name is Fikrek Alik, and he was photographed in this exact spot for a Time magazine cover back in 1992. You are quite literally looking twice with these images. Emaciated, it's almost hard to recognize him. Fikrek can be seen holding his t-shirt in one hand and reaching with his other through the barbed wire to take someone's hand. This is during the Bosnian War from 1992 to 95, and Fikrek was one of
one of many prisoners held in camps at the time. This recreation of the Time magazine cover was taken in the mid 2000s and the building behind him now is a community center without any plaques or memorials of the victims of the notorious prisoner camps in Bosnia. This region is now under the rule of the same faction that was responsible for the camp, so they engage in a lot of historical denials and concealing. Fikret's story remains one of incredible perseverance, especially as he and other victims still go before the UN today in battle to have reparations and acknowledgement. This vintage photo isn't so vintage, but it's old enough so I'm counting it. It's bad Santa. This early 2000s family Christmas photo reps a normal looking scene. White picket fence family, the itchy velvet Christmas dresses, the big sparkly tree, and the serial killer Santa. That there is Bruce MacArthur. In the warm seasons, he is a landscaper, but working in the Agincourt Mall as Santa during the holidays. Between 2010 and 2017, he terrorized the gay village district of Toronto, Ontario. Luring men in through dating apps, he killed and disposed of eight individuals in the planter boxes of properties he managed. For a long time in the community, people had known someone was taking gay men off the street, but the Toronto police were resistant in believing something was suspicious. I remember myself seeing posts on Reddit and Twitter mere months after the first of the disappearances, frustrated with the lack of police action and urging the community members to stay alert. It takes multiple victims and community engagement for police to start an investigation and it's thankfully in the nick of time. They'd been watching Bruce for a while before his arrest when they saw a young man enter his place. After about a half hour of nothing, they decide to make the risk to move in for an arrest. When they entered the unit, the young man was tied up and unconscious and they caught Bruce in the act. No way to plead guilty, my guy. He's found guilty of eight counts of first degree murder. Our next vintage photo is one that speaks to a still in modern times, a determined mother. This photo was taken on Mother's Day. The woman in it is Margie, a 23 year old, and she's holding her infant son while attempting to hitchhike. As you can see, it was printed in a newspaper column and has a subject line describing Margie's struggle with her husband Mike to find an apartment. I imagine that struggle alongside the fact that she is hitchhiking likely correlates with financial difficulties. Unfortunately, Margie's luck never got better. This is very likely the last photo of Margie alive. Less than four months later, she was killed by her husband Mike during a fight. In the time between this photo and her demise, their son Brandon had been taken away and put into foster care, where he was later adopted by his foster parents after Margie's sudden death. Little information exists on the photo other than this and on what Brandon's life became. This is still recent enough history that some may recognize the story, the manifesto man. This photo seems so simple. A man appears to be in a wetsuit, he has multiple police badges displayed, and he sits in a stoic manner. This is no cop. In fact, this photo was taken after his arrest in July of 2011 for killing 77 people and injuring 250. Anders Behring had a manifesto for killing political enemies as a far right extremist, first killing eight people outside the tower block housing of the office of the prime minister. The method used caused distraction, enough for Anders slipping away in a police disguise to pull part two of his plan, which is hop in the ocean and swim to political youth swing summer camp just starting the season. He chose the summer camp for the politicians who came to visit the camp, which was for members of political youth adult clubs and organizations for co-ops, school courses, or just special interest in politics. Once on the island, well, he opened fire. Many who were afraid and unsure of where the danger was coming from went towards Anders for safety due to his police costume and received the opposite. His verbalized intent that day was to kill everyone he could and thankfully he did not succeed. But some swam away and were rescued by people staying at campgrounds across the water who brought out boats to pull everyone out. Others hid in various places on the island. Netflix released the film 22nd of July about this event in Oslo and the movies White Rage and Brave Hearts also tell the story. Ultimately this event only took place due to Anders racist ideology, believing Norwegian politicians were lenient on immigrants. Let's talk about the most disastrous hostage crisis our world might have ever seen, the Gladbeck hostage bus. The 1988 crisis in Gladbeck, Germany was the kind of disaster you don't see often. In this photo, you'll see a robber left and a hostage right taken on the last day of the situation. Day one, two dudes rob a bank and take some hostages. They demand a getaway car and took two hostages and then stopped for one of the robber's sisters casually on the way as reporters follow. Day two, the same robbers hijack a bus with 32 passengers. Whilst holding out in the bus, they allow reporters some entry to interview them. One robber even came outside the bus for an interview like an MTV crib situation but with hostages. The robbers state that their stance is that they don't care what happens because they'd simply take their own lives anyway if it all went wrong. Obviously this is a sign for police to maybe, I don't know, handle with a lot of caution. And like tossing stones at glass houses, caution was non-existent. When the robbers take off in the bus, once again followed by police and reporters just doing nothing, the robber's sister is arrested by police at the first gas station they stop at. Her arrest causes the robbers to lash out 
out and kill a hostage so the police release her and go back to doing nothing. After this, the road trip crosses jurisdictions into Netherlands. The Dutch police are now involved and they demand the release of any young hostages on board with the promise of a BMW in return. The robbers took two hostages with them in the BMW and drove back to Germany. Later on, they were surrounded by a lot of media reporters who took a lot of pictures of the scene which can be found in Google. That is where our photo of the hostage and the robber was taken. Finally, the German police after days of this make a move that isn't just following the robbers like a lost puppy. They rammed the hostage car, causing a crash. One of the hostages flees off the highway as police and robbers engage their firearms. The woman in our photo, Silky Bischoff, is sadly caught in the crossfire. The driving robber said later in an interview that the bullets came from a policeman, but the German police denies that and says that the bullets came from the robbers and hit the hostage. No matter what, the one thing I can say about this whole story is what the f was anyone trying to accomplish here?